tonight we're debating Trump versus Biden, and we're starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a fun one, folks, a very special one. And want to let you know, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a nonpartisan debate platform. And we have debates on politics, science, and religion. And want to let you know, no matter what walk of life you're from, we totally welcome you here. We're glad you're here. We hope you have a great time. And with that... I'm going to give you some of the details about the debate, but want to mention, if this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have many more debates to come. So, for example, on Monday, our good friend Oliver Janich will be debating Vosh on climate change. So that should be a lot of fun. Tune in for that. And for tonight, we are going to have a fairly flexible format. You could say 10 to 12 minutes or so for the opening statements, could be even shorter than that, up to the speaker. Then we will be having about 50 to 60 minutes of open dialogue and then Q&A for about 30 minutes. So if you happen to have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, it makes it easier for me to get every question in that Q&A list to try to work through during that Q&A. Super Chat is also an option, in which case it'll push your question to the top of the list and also, want to let you know, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the speakers, as well as ask if they'd be willing to share about what you can find at their links, which are conveniently already down there in the description box waiting for you right now, folks. So we'll start with Dr. Ben Burgess. We are very excited to have you here, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us and want to let you know, folks, so he is a philosopher you could say philosophy professor, philosopher, synonymous, and also has his own podcast. And you've seen him in many places on YouTube as well. So welcome. Thanks so much, Ben, for being here. And what can people expect to find at your link? Uh, thanks for having me, James. Uh, so they can find the uh, the podcast, which is called Give Them an Argument. And uh, it's also on YouTube, premieres on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m., uh, and they can also find links to what I've written in uh, Jacobin, where I've got a regular column, uh, and um, I don't know, miscellaneous stuff. I forgot what all I put there. You bet. Thanks so much. And we will kick it over to Mr. Reagan, who is a popular YouTuber who defends Donald Trump and want to, oh, that's, that gives me an opportunity. I want to, I want to let you know, folks, that is, though Mr. Reagan is a legit Trump backer, big time Trump. However, I have to clarify, as Ben said, he would take this debate, but he's not really a Biden guy. So Ben, is he said, hey, if it's kind of a lesser of two evils kind of debate, he's like, I, I'm not a Trump guy, that's for sure. And so basically, I want to let you know that that's kind of where the two angles of, of where each of our speakers will, will come tonight. And so with that, though, Mr. Reagan, thrilled to have you here. What can people expect to find at your link? Well, you could just go to my YouTube channel and you'll find hilarious and brilliant videos that everyone will love. Fun for the whole family. Thanks so much. <laughs> Excited to have you guys here. And with that, we will get it started for tonight. You know, I never actually, in the discussion as we set this up, I never asked who would like to go first. Does anybody have a preference on who would like to go first? I actually don't mind, but since Ben went first last time, I can do do him a favor and just present him with my basic argument first, if he likes. Up to you. Okay. It says I'm the s stronger supporter of one of the candidates. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. I also would like to say that I brought these. Sorry. A, a special weapon. Secret weapon, Ben. You ready for this? All right. Let's do it. Boom. Ooh. See that? 30% smarter right here. Yeah. So like science, it says that from the science, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's so right. So you're in trouble. No, I'm not actually going to wear those because that's silly. Yeah, no. I have 2020 vision. I remember when Rick Perry did that. <laughs> did he really? No, he, he literally he ran for president twice, and the second time he was wearing you know, like like he started wearing glasses. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't take me. Don't don't uh, don't lack respect just because I don't have the glasses. All right, we're taking yeah. those off. Hey, I'll take mine off. That's fine. That's fine. Oh no, no, you can, you can wear them. It's all good. All right, let's see here. I would just like to start out by saying this. Trump is the best possible president in 2020. 
not for conservatives, for literally everyone. All right. People say he's divisive. He's not divisive. If you look at all of his accomplishments, right, if you actually read his policy measures, the things that he has signed, he's not even really right wing. He's totally moderate. If anything, he, he might be considered a little bit left politically. Why is he considered far right wing? He's considered far right wing because of slurs, because of slander and libel from the left wing media, primarily CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, these kind of places, because they don't like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not an establishment guy. Donald Trump is not a far leftist. He does not help push forward the progressive uh, ideas that a lot of reporters and people think are really great, right? Uh, but let's let's look through a couple of things. These are just a few things that I listed real quick right before the show. I didn't put them all up. He created, he's essentially created peace in the Middle East. You'll probably debate me on that. You'll probably think that that's not 100% true. But he has done more to establish peace in the Middle East than like any other president. All of his international policies have been amazing. He's de-escalated tensions with North Korea. He's He's done a fantastic job on that front, which all leftists up until the time of Trump thought was a good idea. Now suddenly, oh, well, we're not so sure. We don't, we don't really want to talk about that. He made CBD and hemp legal, right? That's something a lot of leftists should love. Uh, you know, the e he fixed the water in Flint. His EPA fixed the water in Flint. That was something everybody's screaming about. Then he went and fixed that. Tr Trump is a doer, right? He's, he's a businessman and he goes in and he doesn't say, let's bring in a committee to figure out how to do this. He just says, what's the best way to do it? He gets some experts. What's the best way to do it? Okay, let's figure out a plan to implement that. And then he actually does it. He does things so much faster and so much more effectively than like any other president probably ever that you, you cannot deny he's effective. If you don't like his policies, okay. You can't deny he's effective. But then if you look at what he's done, he signed into law uh, a law that gave pharmacists the legal right to properly advise patients. We can get uh, FOSTA and SESTA helped fight tra sex trafficking. Um, let's see here. Because of his economy before coronavirus, uh, Americans were getting a 4.5% income boost. Uh, there's 13 millions of, million acres of wilderness that have been ex you know, expanded to national parks. He's designated a lot of land as wilderness. So you know, environmentalists should love him. He did. He did. Excuse me. Deregulated prescription drug imports from uh, Canada, so drug prices have dropped 11 percent under Trump. He created parental leave for federal employees. Uh, these are all left-wing things. Things that leftists have always said that they've always wanted, and they've never been able to get under any president, including Obama, including uh, Bill Clinton. He created the First Step Act that aimed to help Black Americans, uh, uh, you know, in the in the judicial system. He increased funding for historically black colleges by like an insane amount, which by the way, I don't like any of the uh, stuff that is specifically targeted to race, I, you know, helping specific races. I don't like that. I, I feel like that divides us as a country, but the left always loves that. They always think we need to give black people more stuff. Well, Trump's definitely done that. Uh, Trump, and there was another thing called the platinum plan that he just put in place. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Trump ordered an initiative to decriminalize homosexuality in every country around the world. The, the weird thing about all this is that you've probably never heard of most of those things, right? Because the media does not talk about his more sort of like left-leaning accomplishments because they want you to think that he's far right. It's not Trump that divides the country. If, if we treated Trump fairly in the media, he would be the most, he would be the least divisive president in history. He would bring the country together, but he's not, <clears throat> they don't report on him appropriately. Now let's turn to Biden. Biden is incompetent. Biden can barely form coherent sentences most of the time. And I have that problem a little bit too, but I'm not running for president right now, maybe one day, <laughs> in which time I'll have to deal with that myself. But it's, I think that it's a huge mistake. And I think most people think it's a mistake to bring in somebody who has trouble formulating sentences, forgets what he's talking about. Uh, and the, the truth is we don't exactly know who we're voting for on the left, because if he does prove to be incompetent, he's going to have to be replaced probably by Kamala at first, but who's going to control her or who's going to control him if he's not replaced? You know, uh, Nancy Pelosi came out talking about the 25th amendment and how this isn't really about Trump and how we got to look at potentially how to make sure our president is competent and this kind of thing. Well, that could also apply to Biden. She could be trying to sweep the leg 
uh, once Biden gets into office and take over herself. Pelosi, as we know, is all about power, right? She's, you know, you had the whole Russian collusion nonsense that she's talked about how, you know, Trump needs to step down and then Pence needs to step down if he has coronavirus so she can take power. I mean, the left is so much about power. You cannot give power to people who desperately want it this much because you know they will inevitably be corrupt. And we can't have the Green New Deal. We can't have that kind of stuff. So we can't have the far left takeover because that'll bankrupt the country. We, can, we can't put in Marxist policies. And I know that you are a Marxist. So, and you can correct me if that's wrong, but Marxism is about power and it's about destruction, right? You got to destroy what exists so that you can build up, so that you can build up uh, a Marxist, excuse me. Hey, buddy. All right. I got I to gotta, I gotta figure out a way to shut him up. I, I didn't bring any toys. That's unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> it's about destroying the country and building up a Marxist empire uh, in the ashes of the old uh, you know, in the, in the ashes of the destroyed nation that, you know, what is left after they raise everything. This is not, this is not a strategy I think Americans actually want. I don't think it's good for anybody. Uh, Marxism destroys incentives. It destroys opportunities for success, for growth. Uh, but Trump had proved in the first, you know, three and a half, four years that he is the best possible president for 2020. Now, after coronavirus, obviously there was a big dip, but he will bring the economy back. That's what he does really, really well. He will make it a V-shaped economy. Uh, I think that what will help is after the left-wing governors, left-wing mayors of this country open everything up after the election, because I, and I think that's really what's holding them back. I think that they have a problem with opening everything up because they know that will rejuvenate the economy and that'll help Trump get elected. And so they're resisting that. But I think as soon as the election's over, whether it's Trump or Biden, everything's going to open up. Things are going to get a lot better pretty dang quickly. Um, but I think Trump is the best person to manage that recovery. Definitely not Joe Biden. All right, that's my pitch. Primarily that Trump is not an extreme right wing candidate, that he is a moderate and he brings people together. Thanks so much. We'll kick it over to Ben for his opening statement. The floor is all yours. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thank you, James. Uh, so I would say uh, that there are, uh, you'll be shocked to hear several things that we just heard that I don't think are right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I do want to focus on, uh, on what you said before Chris's opening statement, uh, which is that of course, as should su surprise exactly no one, uh, I'm not a huge supporter of Joe Biden, to put it mildly. I tried very, very, very hard. Uh, to get somebody else nominated instead. Uh, and uh, I'm actually, I don't know why we're talking about Marxism when we're talking about a spineless gray blur of a corporate centrist like Joe Biden. Uh, <laughs> Fair. Whatever you think about that. Um, Marxism, and you know, there are a lot of interesting claims that were just made about that, but Marxism is not on the ballot. Trump and Biden are on the ballot. Uh, and if you care about uh, the well-being of the American working class, uh, then I think this is this is a no-brainer. Uh, you know, Biden uh, is is not certainly anybody I would see as a friend ideologically. I think he stands in the way of all kinds of things that we desperately need, uh, especially during the COVID crisis, like national health insurance. Uh, but I think that Trump has been an absolute disaster in those terms. So. In 2016, he lied. He said he was a different kind of Republican. He said he wouldn't cut entitlements. He said he was pro-worker. He went to places like Youngstown and Lordstown, Ohio, where post-industrial dislocation has caused dystopian levels of misery. And he promised that he would bring the jobs back. In fact, he told people uh, not to sell their homes because when he was elected, the jobs were coming back. That hasn't happened. There have been modest increases in some industrial jobs because the slow recovery that was happening throughout the Obama administration accelerated under Trump. We can talk a little bit more about why that is, but there's certainly been no boom of new industrial jobs. The mass layoffs at GM's Lordstown plant in Ohio where Trump went and told people not to sell their houses in 2016 weren't reversed. In fact, the opposite happened. It shut down production entirely in 2019. The steel mills certainly didn't come back to Youngstown, a city I've visited many, many times since my mom grew up there and my grandparents lived there until they died and some of my relatives are still there. 
I've been to Youngstown, we owned the Trump era, and it's still a hellscape of heroin addiction and shuttered storefronts. Did the coal plants come back to West Virginia now that Trump ended that supposed war on coal? Well, as of February 2019, more than two years into Trump's presidency and before his catastrophic mishandling of the COVID crisis destroyed the economy, the number of coal jobs in West Virginia was at a historic low, thousands less than there were at any time during the Obama administration. And of course, let's remember why people in those places wanted so desperately for those industrial jobs to come back. It's not because steel workers in Youngstown liked working at steel mills and breathing industrial pollutants all day, every day that gave so many of them lung cancer. It's not because auto workers in Lordstown liked working in the, no the noisy and dangerous conditions of an auto plant. My dad worked at a plant like that for a little while in Lansing, Michigan in the early 70s, and he still has a scar from an industrial accident. Uh, that's not inherently more fun or more rewarding work than working at a grocery store or a restaurant. The reason the loss of those jobs that Trump got so much mileage by lying and saying he was going to bring them back was so traumatic was that they were unionized. It's not a law of nature that so-called unskilled line workers at an auto plant in Lordstown or a steel mill in Youngstown made so much more money and have so many more benefits than their equivalents at Walmart and McDonald's. It's 100% due to the UAW and the United Steel Workers. So let's talk about labor. The Trump administration has been a relentless enemy of labor. His appointees to the National Labor Relations Board have gutted protections for working people, overturning precedent after precedent from the Obama administration and before, always, in every case, literally every case, at the expense of labor and in the interests of bosses. Labor law is worse for the working class now than it's been at any point since the Great Depression. He made it harder for unions to get information about joining uh, about how to join to workers in non-unionized workplaces. He's made it harder for shop stewards to help uh, workers with grievances in unionized workplaces. He's made it harder for new unions to be recognized in the first place and for old unions to negotiate for better wages and working conditions. He's bragged about the wage increases for low wage workers in the first few years uh, pre-COVID, but what Trump supporters won't tell you is that most of that increase has nothing to do with anything he's done. It's a result, uh, this is not me, this is the National Employment Law Project saying this, of 26 states raising the minimum wage in the last few years. Where's Trump been on that? He opposed efforts by House Democrats to raise the federal minimum wage after flip-flopping a bunch of times. And of course, with regard to the poorest and most desperate working class people, he's done a lot worse than that. Workers and their families who fled to the United States from Mexico and point south, willing to take terrible jobs in dirty and dangerous conditions because they were fleeing from grinding poverty and cartel violence, have been rounded up outside their churches, outside their children's schools, at their jobs, in the streets. Uh, and some of this started under the Obama administration. Hey, I'm a Bernie guy. I'm not an Obama or Biden apologist. <laughs> but the plain fact is that it's gotten far worse under Trump. Uh, including uh, absolute horrors and international embarrassments and human rights abuses uh, like, the, uh, like the Trump child separation policy. And if anybody tries to tell you that the motivation for this brutal and inhuman uh, war against immigrant workers has been a desire to keep up the wage levels of American workers, remember all that stuff I just said about the Trump administration's labor policy and don't believe it. Now, it is true, what the counter always is, we heard a little bit of this in uh, Chris's opening statement, is, oh, before COVID, the Trump economy was so good, you know, there were more jobs. Well, at that point, there were a couple of possible explanations that you might believe of that. One explanation uh, was that you'd had a recovery uh, that had been going frustratingly slowly, but going for several years already, and that it was picking up steam around that time, uh, and that Trump was in the right place at the right time. But that wasn't the only explanation. Uh, you know, it, it might have been plausible at one point that the reason was that Trump was just so awesome uh, at doing things that would result uh, in the creation of jobs, that, you know, that he, he was just such a good expert custodian of the economy. Well, at this point, we know that's not true because his uh, handling of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which has been, I think, criminally negligent is the most generous thing that you can call it. Um, 
mass murder by neglect uh, would, uh, would be a little bit more accurate. It's one of the absolute worst performances with regard uh, to the virus in the, on the entire planet, uh, literally in terms of new cases and deaths per thousand. Uh, one of the very worst, like as part of a, you know, there are, there are countries that are worse, but it's a very short list and they tend to be governed by Trump type uh, right-wing demagogues with, uh, with authoritarian tendencies, uh, people like Jair Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil and um, Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, you know, et cetera, right? So of course, this makes it impossible to turn around the economic devastation that's caused by COVID. You can blame it all you want on the initial lockdowns, but all you have to do is lift up your eyes a little bit and notice the comparative economic statistics uh, with the rest of the world. More people live in the Eurozone uh, than live in the United States, but uh, in uh, the last few months, uh, only a few million uh, in, uh, in the EU applied for uh, unemployment benefits and tens of millions did in the United States uh, because countries where you had real serious uniform lockdowns uh, that allowed the spread to be somewhat contained so you could implement the only serious solution that would actually let people resume normal life, which would be a national test and trace system, uh, those places were able to reverse much of the economic damage caused by the virus in ways that the United States simply wasn't uh, that as as a matter of fact uh, what we've uh, you know what we've seen in the United States has been a catastrophic handling of COVID leading to catastrophic economic consequences that cannot be purely blamed on the lockdowns as shown by comparing states that barely locked down like Georgia where I just came from uh, that uh, had uh, that reopened so soon that that even Trump was critical of them for out for it at one point uh, to how other states that maintain lockdown measures for far longer do, uh, were doing, uh, and they did not, in fact, reap great economic benefits from that decision because when people are worried that going out to eat or getting a haircut could kill them, kill grandma, uh, even if you're young and healthy, could lead to permanent lung damage, then you're a lot less likely to do any of those things. Uh, I know I'm almost out of time, but I did just want to briefly address a couple of things that Chris brought up in his, uh, in his opening statement uh, on the question of uh, foreign policy, for example, said he created peace in the Middle East and de-escalated tensions with North Korea. Uh, this, this second one is particularly funny to me, I have to say, uh, as somebody who, uh, who lived in uh, South Korea for years, saw those tensions playing out for a long time uh, because, <laughs> Donald Trump ratcheted up tensions with North Korea to the worst point they'd been at any point before the Korean War, and then his whims shifted uh, and he made peace overtures. Similarly, on the Middle East, uh, Trump's uh, assassination of, uh, of Soleimani uh, in, uh, in Iran uh, brought us closer than, uh, than we've probably ever been to the brink of war with Iran. We have a peace, there's a, uh, there's a peace deal between Israel and the UAE, uh, which was not particularly a country that was in any danger whatsoever of going to war with Israel, but he's made the possibility of lasting and just peace between Israel and the Palestinians vastly less likely by doing ridiculous provocative things like certifying the Israeli annexation of East Jerusalem uh, by, uh, by, moving the, uh, by moving the US embassy. Uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem. Final point, last few seconds I've got, I just want to say this, that I think that we all know that Trump is in fact quite divisive. In fact, a lot of Trump's more honest supporters will say that what they love about him is that he triggers the libs. He's so good at lib triggering, they like to see him mad. And so I'd say if you are considering voting for Trump, seriously think about this. How much do you enjoy living, bathing in never end in culture war. Does anybody like that? Is triggering the libs really a goal worth pursuing? I don't think so. But on vastly more important questions like the wages, 
the living standard of ordinary Americans, Donald Trump has been a disaster. And for that alone, even if he hadn't been president for the COVID crisis, that he mishandled so disastrously that 213,000 of your fellow Americans are dead, he would have to go. Come on, come on. <laughs> we'll jump into the open conversation portion. And so with that, thanks so much, gentlemen. want to remind you folks, they're both linked in the description box right now if you'd like to hear more. And with that, we'll jump right into it. So thanks so much, guys. The floor is all yours. Uh, which one of us do you want to speak? I assume me, because... Yeah, it will be your turn. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> this argument, I, I don't really want to go into COVID because this whole idea that... Trump killed grandma. You know, I mean, everybody knows that's totally disingenuous. Trump didn't make the virus. Trump didn't spread the virus. Trump didn't do anything to encourage the virus. He did a lot to try to curtail the growth of the virus. No one was ever going to be able to stop the virus from infecting people in the United States. That was never going to be possible. But we'll, I'll get into that in a second. First, I want to go through. Mm -hmm. you, you, you said a lot of things. <laughs> you said a lot of words there. And it's I just don't have time to go through them all, but I will go through as many as I can. Okay. You did a lot of cherry picking. I do, I do, I do, want, to, I do want to respond to yeah. the thing about, about Trump and COVID, but we'll save yeah. it. Yeah, I would, I'll, I'll go back to that. I'll come back to that. Uh, look, you were engaging at the beginning of this talking about certain towns that didn't get manufacturing jobs back, uh, certain, certain data, certain industries, stuff like that. That's what we call cherry picking, right? You're well aware of that. You talk about, you know, you teach debate. Right. You know about this trick. Right. You, you, you pick certain data points and you say, well, this wasn't perfect and that wasn't perfect. But the truth is that Trump did create jobs and that Trump did increase household income and Trump did bring back a lot of manufacturing. If he didn't bring back every single manufacturing job in every single town for every single person, that dis doesn't mean that he didn't do a great job, way better than Obama well, did. That's, well, that's what we call a straw man. The objection is not that it's not a straw man. It is. It's not the objection that I'm laying out. It's mm. not that he didn't bring back every single manufacturing job. It's that he. Uh, it's that uh, there has been, in general, no great boom of manufacturing jobs. In fact, a lot of the specific jobs that he specifically promised to bring back, exactly the opposite has happened. He said he was going to bring back the coal mines to West Virginia. Coal jobs in West Virginia are at an all-time historic low and were before COVID. Okay, so you're judging then you're judging somebody's promises uh, generally on specific evidence. So you're saying that okay, if you brought so back if jobs, somebody, if somebody promises to do a specific thing and the opposite of that thing happens, that's not a promise that's been kept. Well, it's going to be difficult for me to go through and discuss every single instance of every single manufacturing job. I'm just not aware of them all. Oh, I mean, uh, but you, you don't have to talk about every instance of every manufacturing job. Has been, there been? a mass influx of millions of manufacturing jobs of the kind that he said that he would I would say there has been a significant influence of manufacturing jobs, far more than I think, I, I believe Biden's or uh, Obama's exact words were, these jo jobs just aren't coming back. And that wasn't true. That, that wasn't true. Tr Trump created 6.6 .6 million jobs in his first three years. 6.6 .6 million. That is a lot of jobs. Now, I don't know exactly how many of those jobs were specifically in coal or oil or the specific areas. Oh, manufacturing in general. Manufacturing as a sector. I don't have that number, but I know that it was significant. I've looked that up in the past. I didn't have time to look that up. But I will tell you this. A lot of the, a lot of the arguments you made were anecdotal. My mom, my dad, you know, different specific people. That is the worst kind of argument. I understand that you're using that to illustrate your point, but it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't show anything. It just says there are certain people who are doing, uh, who are having a hard time, right? Oh, it's 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 uh, it's it's illustrating a point. The point right. is proven with the statistical information. But it's totally what, irrelevant. It's what, totally what, irrelevant. Well, I don't think so. I think that I think that it's I think that making a point more vivid by okay answer me this did anybody ever have on, a hard one sec, time one sec, during one sec mr mr Regan, pardon my interruption just to let ben finish and then i promise we'll come right back to you okay, okay. chris wallace <laughs> <laughs> zing <All> right. <laughs> hey if the corresponding character in, in, in that night's events is, is the comparison <laughs> with the I, I have trump in this scenario i will admit that yeah okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think that was widely seen as a good look. But, um, no, no. but, uh, but in any case, I was going to say I think that that if the vivid illustrations are used in place of data, sure, that's bad. 
if they are accompanied by data, like Trump saying, hey- You didn't accompany not, by data. You I, I did. by cherry picking. I, it was not cherry picking. Trump <laughs> okay. said, this was something he said more than once, right? Oh, by ending Obama, the Obama administration's war on coal, we're gonna bring those coal mines back to, uh, to West Virginia. In fact, mm -hmm. when he really did cherry pick and looked at a couple of specific mines that had come back, he said uh, in November, 2018, you know, uh, the run up to that election, that he, he took credit for bringing back coal to West Virginia, even though by then the overall numbers of coal jobs there were at a historic low, thousands of jobs less than existed at any time in the Obama administration. So you're arguing, we're, we're having a debate here in which you're arguing that you wish Trump had brought back more coal jobs. Uh, no, I'm arguing, I'm arguing, I'm arguing that, that, uh, that Trump lied. Do I think, as I said, no, 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 no. As Breaking a no, no, promise no, 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 is no, not no, the but... same as a lie. Breaking the promise is not the same as a lie. I think you're aware of that. I think that if you don't, Do you think he had no intention, he had no intention of bringing back coal. Yeah. I think he had no, I think he, he did not have the slightest intention. Well, that's a hell of an assumption. Okay. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a fair one. I think what evidence do you have to support that? The, I, I know that leftists think that they're mind readers, but I'm sec, curious right. how you did read his mind Let's hear to the, know that the he answer. Not... <laughs> well, uh, I think that, I don't think you have to be a mind reader. I think you just have to look at, uh, at what he did. Is, uh, did he actually do anything or even try yes. to do anything? Yes, it's no, called what, deregulation. What, yeah, well, I think if, so I think that if he sincerely believes that deregulation would bring back all those coal jobs, then mm -hmm. he gets credit for honesty, but not a lot of credit for examining the evidence. As far as the other question you're bringing up, do I want there to be a bunch of new coal jobs? No, but what I said in the opening statement was that it's not some law of nature that the jobs at the coal mine or the steel mill or the auto plant or the good jobs and other kinds of jobs aren't good jobs. What actually made those jobs good jobs were these powerful industrial unions that have brought up wages. What I would like, uh, is to have a Green New Deal and create millions and millions of new unionized public sector jobs converting <laughs> us to a green energy infrastructure. Okay, l l about unions, I, I don't want to get too much into unions, but I will say this. A lot of the reason why many jobs in America went away in the first place, many uh, manufacturing jobs were because of unions. Right. I, I will I will grant you that unions have helped historically to bring people's wages up, but you've got a lot of regulation, right? You've got a lot of regulation to protect uh, employees from dangerous work conditions uh, to uh, have a minimum wage, this sort of thing. Uh, when the minimum wage was first instated, I think that the equivalent today would be like something like five bucks. I mean, it was unbelievably low and it has slowly increased over time to a, a rate that is not sustainable for certain kinds of jobs, right? For certain so, kinds so, of jobs. So, so if you're going to believe this, mm -hmm. that the reason that those jobs went away was because of unions. Some then, some of the jobs, then, not then every job. Okay, well, you're gonna have a very hard time, right? So like okay. at, the, at the risk, you know, at, at the risk of being accused of cherry picking, let's try to make this a little bit more concrete. I think you've uh. got some specific examples, right? So is the reason uh, that, um, that all of those jobs left uh, Flint, Michigan, for example, is mm -hmm. that because of the UAW? If so, you have to explain why it is that the UAW was in place throughout much of the 1930s, all of the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and then its existence made the jobs go away in the 1980s. That that's seems very like, easy. That seems it's a little plausible, it's, whereas a, it's much easier to explain that. It's an escalation of power. By, by, by saying, that what, what, what changed second, wasn't whether it was a union shop or not. What had changed uh, was the international trade regulations uh, that really greased the skids uh, for, uh, for taking them away, which, by the way, uh, to get to another place where Trump has, you know, to put it generously, because sure, who knows, we can't read his mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe at one point he did have an intention that he later gave up on, right? But one place where Trump's rhetoric conspicuously failed to match the reality uh, right. was uh, was what's happened uh, with trade. There's been a certain a certain amount of renegotiation and, uh, and bilateral trade agreements. But as far as the basic thing about those uh, those agreements that made them very much in the interests of corporations, very much not in the interests of workers, there has been very very little uh, movement there. And I think that when he said in you know in 2016, oh. 
you know, this was all part of the same pitch, right? You know, because uh, because he would criticize the trade deals. He'd say he was going to bring the jobs back. Uh, they and the trade deal thing has uh, has happened to some extent. But I mean, what are you talking about, Ben? Most of what's wrong with NAFTA is wrong with the bilateral uh, agreement, you know, between uh, between the United States and Mexico. Uh, there's uh, like anybody who ever had a problem with that for all the good reasons that you'd have to be a problem with it would be, let's put it this politely, underwhelmed by the replacement. Okay, one, okay, one fine. Second. So, but, pardon my interruption. We There's a, a small volume discrepancy. I just want to be sure oh, that sorry. I think what if we could maybe uh, I didn't notice it. I actually checked beforehand, but it, maybe sometimes Mike's do weird things if if we're able sure. to ben if you're able to turn yours up just a bit and mr reagan if you're able to turn yours down just a bit uh, uh, it might bring us to where we're kind of back in in balance with each other and then also uh, right, how's that bring it, bring it i think that's closer and what we could also do is maybe just a really quick rejoinder from mr reagan and then i, I would definitely yell. want to cover uh foreign policy as we haven't gotten to talk about it that much yet so I yeah. came, came up during well, we're the talking opening. about foreign policy now. I mean, uh, if you're saying that Trump doesn't negotiate good deals internationally, I mean, you, you can easily, easily just point to China. I mean, he's been criticized like crazy for trying to put tariffs on China. Uh, right. There has been some pain even among some you know industries, especially farming in the United States, because yeah, a of lot the of jobs have lost. A lot of people have paid more. But yeah, true, true. And he's, but the reason that he's doing that is precisely what you're talking about. It's so disingenuous what you're saying because you rec you, you're, you recognize the criticism against Trump for forcing certain kinds of farmers to suffer under certain under these negotiations with China, right? Although he did he did counterbalance that with some uh, supplementary you know help for these farmers, but to to sit here and say that he's not tough negotiating internationally. But then to sustain that criticism against him is so ridiculous. It's just absurd. But let's let's move back to COVID, that's actually, not, because not the, you wanted to. That's, that's that's not the criticism. The criticism right. isn't about lack of toughness. The criticism. Okay. Okay. Is about whether, no, it's not right. The, okay. The problem with the problem with NAFTA, the problem with the WTO, was never any lack of trouble of of toughness or the United States being screwed over by other countries or anything like this. The fact is. The problem is that these uh, these deals were negotiated on behalf of the interests of corporations in ways that uh -huh. were very bad for the interests of workers, uh, both in the United States and in other countries. How how are they and, worse? And uh, the uh, when we look at the uh, at the bad effects, you know, I don't think tariffs are always bad. I think that yeah, I think that you can, you know, I think that you can do it in uh, in a careful way, in a way that makes sense, uh, and it could sometimes be justified. But if we're going to be intellectually honest here, the evidence seems pretty clear that the Trump tariffs have not just hurt a few farmers. They have led to uh, quite a bit of uh, of job losses due to the inevitable retaliatory tariffs. Sure. Uh, but you know, you, you know that the negotiations were stalled because of coronavirus. But but the reality is that in the long term, having some tariffs to use as a negotiating tool is look, free trade is amazing if both sides are playing fair. Right. We know that China was never playing fair. Right. So therefore, putting on tariffs as a negotiating tool, as a negotiating tool was something that uh, Obama, Biden, they never did anything like that. I mean, you tell me, OK, coronavirus, you say that Trump failed on coronavirus, which is totally nonsense. Well, I mean, obviously. I think if you compare the numbers of the United States to the international numbers and look at the ranking, right, I think that we're something like in the top 10 countries in the world, not in terms of number of cases and number of deaths per thousand, which is why when you, when you said earlier that, sure, Trump didn't create the virus, mm -hmm. ironically, by the way, uh, Trump style deregulation in China of the wet markets did create the virus by lifting the ban on selling wild meat, but whatever. Uh, the uh, Trump, oh, dude, Trump Trump does not control the regulations no, no, no. in China. No, 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 he doesn't. That's why I said style. But Trump, uh, but sure, Trump, uh, yes, dere okay, that sorry, is such maybe, a weak sorry, argument. Sorry, 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 is deregulation, you know, good in the United States, but bad in China? That'd be very weird. Or are the laws? So you're saying that all deregulation is the same across the board? No, I'm saying that it is a little ironic in this context that the reason this happened in the first place was because of deregulation. But let's talk about Trump's response because you say, sure, Trump didn't create the virus, uh, but and nobody's Trump's nobody Trump's is saying he, he did. The question is, how, has he handled the virus in ways that led to vastly more deaths 
than we would have gotten. Yeah, and the, the answer is you have no idea. And, and the answer is we actually do have an idea. No, you don't. Because you know, of course we do. There's a okay. very easy right. way tell that we me. can tell, tell me. which is that we look at the number of deaths per thousand in the United States compared to other countries around the world. And we could see that the Trump administration has mishandled it worse than- Okay, so every single death is a, is a fault of a federal law or a federal- the question, the question isn't every single death. The question is, what's the overall rate of deaths? Because Where are of most, course, of, the given, Where are most given, of the deaths? Where are most of the deaths in America any, taking any, place? Any given death. The highest concentration could, of deaths. Where was any, it? Any given death. Come could on, Ben. Let's happen. be honest. You said intellectually honest. Any given honest. death could happen under, uh, you know, like due to a thousand individual factors. But when we uh -huh. look at the rate of deaths, mm -hmm. then you have to link that with the total absence of any kind of meaningful federal response, the total lack of any kind of attempt uh, to encourage lockdowns that uh, that could have- uh, that Not could true, have, I, not I, true. I, I, that was federal I, I, guidance, I, I, which I disagree I, I, with. That was federal I, I, guidance. Lockdown was federal guidance. There, what are you talking uh, there, about? Well, I think, that, uh, I think that if you're looking at whether Trump was encouraging or discouraging those. I don't think that you can just look at, oh, about? that was at, federal at a, guidance. At a, he was encouraging them actively. Oh, do you think what I'm saying might be might be relevant to this point that you're making? Uh, that the, uh, that yes, after sustained criticism, after sitting on their hands as the virus spread and more and more people died, uh, after doing everything possible to minimize it, in fact, admitting to Bob Woodward that he they closed knew, travel how, how to China that, when everybody that, else that, said that that was that he, racist. Yes, yes, that is the one read that Trump supporters can cling to because they know one that read. he was- You just said he, he didn't was, do anything, he, but he did something he was, significant. He was, actually, first of all, it's not significant. That's not where it was coming to the US from for the most part. It was coming from Europe at that he point. He closed but it from whatever, Europe as well. They have a- As soon as uh, they figured out it was coming from so, Europe, they closed Europe. So- I don't, pff, what are you talking okay, about? Okay. Am I going to be able to say this or no? Well, not if it's, you just lie the whole time. It's well, difficult. okay. First of all, you like, first of all, I caught, I caught you in about 50 lies in your opening statement. You'll notice didn't. I didn't correct any did of them. Not. Oh, I absolutely did. But they have a, uh, but if That's we're going, if we're going to talk about this, right, is issuing guidance eventually after uh, a criminally negligent initial response eventually grudgingly after minimizing it after admitting to bob woodward that he knew how much worse it was than what he was saying uh you can compare what he says in that tape to what he said in public speeches uh eventually putting out some guidance and then very very quickly without using that as an opportunity to implement something like test and trace uh very very quickly reversing course and talking about and tweeting things like liberate michigan uh encouraging people who are doing things like an armed occupation of the michigan state oh, capitol no yeah i think that that is a criminally negligent response the fact that they eventually got around to issuing some federal guidance before very quickly reversing course is a pretty slim defense of an indefensible record. Mr. You Reagan, I can give you a short chance to respond. And then I definitely try, I would like to try, if we don't cover foreign policy, maybe race and violence in the cities. Oh yeah, no, I'll get to that right now, okay? Th that's that's a perfect segue, actually. I, I was gonna cover some other stuff that he mentioned, but this is fine, we can get into this. Uh, so you're saying that because some people protested wearing masks and being in lockdown and that sort of thing in Michigan, that Trump caused all the deaths. You're completely neglecting. That's not at all what I said. It's an obvious caricature, but go on. Okay, an obvious caricature, fine. You're, but you're completely neglecting the fact that if you take out New York, if you take out New York City from all of the deaths in the United States, all of the, you know, all of the, 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 uh, the data all changes, right? All the graphs yeah, suddenly you take change. take out New York City, almost nobody died on 9-11. I mean, that's, that's what exactly. we came to play. Exactly right, but nobody blames any... American leader for negligence for 9-11. Everybody's blaming Trump for coronavirus. Well, but if you're going to blame a leader for coronavirus, you're neglecting Cuomo. You're neglecting, you're, you're just, you're neglecting, you're, you're saying that putting old people into nursing homes with, who had coronavirus, right? Which every conservative said, what the hell are you doing? That's a disaster. Right. And Cuomo was like, no, 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 it's fine. This is this is our policy. This is what we're going to do. Everybody's like, are you meant even at the time people were criticizing it at the time? 
And you're saying somehow, though, but all the deaths in New York, though, that was all federal. That was all Trump's fault, even though his guidance was lockdowns. Biden wasn't saying no, no, no Democrat was saying we need to lock everything down. We need to lock everything down for like weeks or months or even days before Trump issued guidance to suggest that people should. Right? this wasn't like he begrudgingly did it. He did that very early on. And early on, we didn't know everything that we know today. Miracle. We didn't know everything that we know today. So to look in hindsight and say, oh, Trump didn't lock down every single business in January is ridiculous. Nobody was calling for that. Uh, what, what's your name? Uh, Freaking Pelosi walked around Chinatown without a mask going, going, look, everything's fine here. Come to Chinatown. Join us. Enjoy so, I, this. So, I, so I can see why you're changing the subject. Because I'm not changing course, the subject. When you're, trying to, when you're trying to defend something indefensible, then shift in what, to no, 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 no. what I'm de Blasio was doing, no, 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 what no. Cuomo was doing, yeah. what Pelosi was doing. Those all make sense because you know you can't defend what Trump was doing when he was saying, what oh, did Trump do that was so bad? Cool. We'll, be, we'll be good by Easter. Uh, you know, we can now we can go back to church then safely. Uh, it's going to go away like a miracle when he was on tape telling Bob Woodward that he was lying to the American people. No, he didn't say he was out. lying to the American people. Look, he, he, he was saying, I always say it's not that bad, but it is actually that bad. You can compare what he was saying when he was comparing it to deaths from the flu with what he was saying to Woodward about just how much worse he knew that it was. And you keep doing this thing. That's where, not true. That's where, not where, true. Where, he where, he where, knew, where, that, it was, he knew say... that it was a dangerous virus, right? But nobody knew how long it was going to last. He didn't sit there and specifically say all the stuff. Trump's not a doctor. He's not a scientist, right? He's not an epidemiologist. He didn't go in there to Woodward and give him a sort of fucking PowerPoint lecture and be like, look, this is how the virus reacts. This is what happens. He just repeats what he hears from so, the doctors. So you, so, you, so you think there was no gap at all between what Trump was saying in public and what he was saying to Woodward at the same time, even though part of what he said to Woodward was precisely that in his public statements, he was minimizing it. No, because you can characterize, if you don't know everything about something, right? You can be optimistic about it or you can be pessimistic about it. If, if the doctors are telling you, we think it might be this, 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 or we might think it'd be, it might be this, this, and this, right? And they, they can give you an estimate. It might be this bad, which would be the worst possible scenario, or it might be this bad, which would be the best possible scenario, right? And you can characterize it in a way that you think is appropriate for how you want the American people to react. You don't remember people were, were, were buying up all the toilet paper. People were reacting in a way that was completely irrational to this virus, right? Buying toilet paper, how did that save anybody's life? It did, that didn't make any sense, right? So Trump was taking the most optimistic approach in his address to the American people whilst behind the scenes, it, it, you know, there's this, ter there's this expression, this old expression, right? Uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, right? So Trump was trying to encourage people to have hope, right? And to encourage them to go about their daily lives in the most optimistic, positive way possible because keeping up spirits is always good. Ask any doctor. Ask even an epidemiologist. Keeping up spirits is incredibly important. But at the same time, behind the scenes, he was doing everything that he possibly could to try to mitigate the spread of the virus. I think that is the most responsible, most presidential approach possible. And everything I would, that ask, he possibly you, I would could. ask you, what, what, what do you think everything Biden... That, what what do I would you like to do is, I, I hate to jump in, but just because we've talked a lot about the coronavirus and we've talked sure. some about the economy, it really would be a great opportunity to jump into one of these other topics, whether it be the uh, kind of race relations that Trump. All right, let me let me shift it to the race thing. Okay, so you you said that you, you thought that the protests in Michigan were a problem that Trump didn't like condemn these protests. It, it wasn't that he didn't protests, condemn it. It's it. that he tweeted out all caps liberate Michigan. Yeah, it's which I agree. The with. other the the other night uh, he was uh, he was he was talking about how. You know, Governor Whitmer wasn't grateful enough uh, to him, and he was minimizing True. the terrorist plot that was just revealed uh, by members of the most hardcore portion of his uh, base uh, to uh, kidnap the uh, the city governor. So, yeah, I think it's a little bit more than that. He, that's a uh, that's an absurd. You're 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 accusing me of a caricature to somehow tie Trump to a plot to kidnap Whitmer is I'm ridiculous. I'm not tying him to it. I'm saying that they you have are, a, okay. Well, I'm, look, clearly you can read my mind. So, I mean, we don't even need to hear. No, I'm, I'm just, just, I'm just, I'm just interpreting your word that you're saying out loud. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. But, all look, right. but well, look, okay. But look, it's, so, it's, it's, so it's, you've it's, got this protest. So, 
you got this protest against the mask, against the lockdowns, which were pretty authoritarian in Michigan. You got to admit. No, but once we have, once we have, once we have, once not. we have Black Lives Matter come out and they start burning down buildings, they start having these riots everywhere, Antifa. Every leftist, Biden, Kamala Harris, everybody forgives that and calls them peaceful protests. And even if you're not having a riot, you are having a peaceful protest. Those gatherings are necessarily going to bring people out who are sick, necessarily going to infect people. But those are all perfectly fine. But anytime anybody from the White House, who, by, by the way, gets tested before every kind of meeting that they ever have at the White House, Everybody at the White House, anybody who doesn't wear a mask is suddenly like trying to kill grandma. But the protests are perfectly fine. We are so obsessed with this insane racial nonsense in America. So, so, you, so you notice what you just said, right? Mm-hmm. Anybody yeah. who doesn't wear a mask right. is trying Vilified. to kill grandma yeah. or is appropriately condemned for recklessly spreading the virus. Whereas, whereas when uh, even when we're talking about, oh, why appropriately? Sho- about, about, about shoulder to shoulder, indoor gatherings like the mm-hmm. vigilante, uh, like the armed occupation of the Michigan state capital by domestic terrorists, that, right, that- You think everybody you know, there was is, a domestic terrorist? That is, yes, I think if you show up to a state capital building waving around, waving around a gun, then that does seem to indicate an attempt to terrorize people to bring about political goals, but we're talking about nobody people, was waving any people, guns. People who are not wearing I didn't masks, see waving of a gun. Who are who are not wearing masks? Uh, who are shoulder to shoulder indoors? And then you're talking about people who are wearing masks who are outdoors, and you're saying that the only possible reason why anybody might evaluate these two things differently. Uh, is because they support one cause and they don't support the other. When if you actually pay any attention to what the scientific experts are saying, there is a vast difference between being indoors with no masks and outdoors with a mask. So you're talking about one protest, which was basically mostly outdoor, by the way. Mostly that was outdoor. Most protests are outdoors. Hundreds of people jammed inside the Capitol building. How many protests, how many Black Lives Matter or anti protesters protests? not wearing masks who are screaming directly into the faces uh, of Capitol cops at the Michigan State this is Capitol. Not, this is, again, anecdotal, right? You're sitting here and you're talking about specific things that are happening with a few people, right? I'm talking about statistics, right? I'm talking about thousands well, not, of actually, protests. You haven't, you're, you haven't mentioned any statistics. Uh, what you know? What you said is that you somehow see a discrepancy between people criticizing maskless right. okay, indoor okay, okay. gatherings well, let's talk, okay, and then let's talk about the details. mask wearing outdoor gatherings in the same light. All right, I, I want to get off Corona anyway. You're, you're being absurd. You're talking about one specific protest, and then you're comparing that to thousands of protests with okay, many so different kinds of characteristics of the, do you, across do, the country. Do you think any of the? Do you think any of the anti-lockdown protests that most people were wearing masks? Do I think any of them what? Oh, that any of them were wearing masks? Yeah, I think a lot of no, them were that, wearing that, masks. No, do I, that's not what I said. Do you think that at any of the anti-lockdown protests, most protesters were wearing masks? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't there at those protests. Okay, were well. Were you? Was I, Okay, were you there at the Black Lives Matter protests? I, I, have, I have been with protesters in Portland, yeah. Okay, so you've been to a couple of protests. They have a, uh, like... The point is, I don't think this is controversial. I like, look, if you want to claim that most people at anti-lockdown protests were wearing masks, I, I don't care about the, the masks. Masks, masks don't work this. anyway. Masks are so stupid. Well, they, well, okay. Every medical expert disagrees with you. That's not true. That's not that true. The, uh, that, that masks don't work at all. That they don't reduce the uh, the rate of infection. Only from sick people. Yeah, that is how infection works. That sick yeah, people. Yeah, so stay home if sick you're sick. People. That works a lot better. Okay. If you're sick, except, don't go except, out. Except that many people don't know that they're sick. No, no, no. Asymptomatic until, spread. Until they, asymptomatic spread is not a thing. Okay. That that was that was a that was that was the approximate epidemiological equivalent of flat eartherism. Of course, asymptomatic spread is a thing for everybody. It's very minimal. Very minimal. Incredibly rare. Look it up. It's incredibly rare. I have looked it up. You are just wrong about this. I am absolutely not wrong. Everybody who is watching this should look that up. Yes, Asymptomatic spread up. is incredibly please rare. Please look that up. Ask a doctor. They will be horrified that you asked them. Of course, asymptomatic spread is a significant thing. And yes, of course, every study, every single study they've done on it shows it's incredibly rare. This is of a course. great opportunity. Yeah. 
Sorry, to, I hate to do this, guys, but just yep. because there are a number of topics. we Foreign policy, I, I know that, Chris, you had mentioned in your opening that uh -huh. allegedly Trump has brought peace to the Middle East in yep. some degree or another. So that, I mm -hmm. thought, would maybe be a good uh, thing to talk about. I'd rather go to the race issue. I think we've covered the foreign uh the, the, the foreign policy a bit i mean i'm open to it we, well, i feel we like i don't i don't feel like I, I feel like ben is gonna say well no matter what good thing foreign policy trump's done it's it's not good enough he hasn't done enough no that's actually not at all what i've done although, okay. you've, right. although you've consistently claimed that i've done what i've claimed for example <laughs> that trump's mishandling of COVID led to a much higher rate than there would be without trump you have caricatured that as my saying that every COVID death is due to trump when i've said that specific that industries and states that he said they've gone back have actually gone in the other direction. You've characterized, you characterized me as saying that I'm saying that Trump didn't bring back every single job. This this is a straw man. I'm not saying that Trump is bad because he hasn't achieved 100% perfection. I'm okay. saying that Trump is bad because he's made things far worse. Well, okay, Ben, let, let me just say, uh, I will never try to straw man you. I will always try to steal man your arguments. If I make a mistake in my interpretation, it's not intentional, first of all. Secondly, you do make more like uh, specific kinds of statements, but then you use evidence to support those statements, which support other kinds of arguments. The only statistics that have been mentioned at any right. point in yep. the last hour have come from me. Really? I didn't say that he created 6.6 .6 million jobs in his first three years. Okay, you said that, but uh, but the question was about industrial jobs. So yeah, that okay. Is well, he, okay, I have the statistic topic. here now. I just found it: four hundred and forty thousand, okay. uh, uh, four hundred and forty thousand manufacturing jobs. That is a drop in the bucket of deal. Oh, but it is, but it's he a lot more significant than zero. That he's going. Okay, okay, okay. Let's forget forget the jobs. We we, we want to move on. So let's talk about this. We we already covered that big time. Let's talk about this. I want to ask you a couple of questions. The basic question I want to ask by, by, you, by the way, according to the CDC, the current best estimate of the percentage of infections that are asymptomatic is 40%. <laughs> well, the WHO would disagree with that. All and right. every other, and every study ever that I've ever read about it would disagree okay, well, with that. They all right, so the centers That's for absolute nonsense. Know what they're talking That's about. absolute nonsense. What the, what the CDC says is absolute nonsense. Well, is the, what the WHO says absolute nonsense? What every scientific what study. What does the WHO say exactly? Right? So, because well, I said the words, I, they said the words very rare, I believe, was, were the words. All right, look, I'm, I'm going to admit something to you. I'm going to admit something to you. I'm going to admit this. Trump is not perfect. He's not a perfect president. He's not a perfect man. There's probably a million things he could have done better, right? But the big question is, could anyone have done any better than him who is currently alive? And I'm not sure that's actually true. No, 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 definitely not. But I would like you to tell me, right, what some you of the, think. Some, some, some of the models suggest that uh -huh. 80 to 90 percent of the deaths could have been prevented models by, by, by shutting down models a week models earlier. do you really models. think one thing that like any other president wouldn't have shut down a week earlier no i don't think so okay and 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 also it wasn't trump's decision to shut down right trump get, trump had to give federal guidance and then governors and mayors had to shut down right if you're going to put this on any leader, you have to put it on the governors and the mayors because they actually had the control of their regions. It was not Donald Trump. So if you think that we've done a terrible job with coronavirus, you've got to blame Cuomo, you've got to blame Whitmer, you've got to blame all no, these people. No, no, no blame goes uh, to uh, to the person. How could who, it if he who, has who, no actual authority to shut anything down? It, well, first if you of think all, shutdowns would have helped, which I don't actually think. I think he should have done the, gone with the Swedish model and not shut anything down. Okay, but, well, Sweden, well, Sweden is in the very small club of countries uh, that are doing, they're actually doing worse as far as infections and deaths than the United States. Uh, so, I, whereas, I'm not sure if, that's if you look true. at the vast majority of countries in the world, almost all of them have handled it better than the United States. No, 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 no. The vast, the vast majority of countries in the world haven't had severe infections. If you're just talking about the Why countries not? with severe infections, the United States is somewhere in the middle. Sweden is somewhere. Yes, how do how do you get to the point where the infections are severe in the first place? I don't know. Do you know? Uh, yes, I do actually. Because I really, think so you think all the first world countries 
are somehow so inept that they're all infected and all the third world countries the you know the countries with tons of poor people all gathered together huddled together they somehow are just like magically really good at dealing with coronavirus well actually some third world countries uh, have been good at dealing with it. Others have not. Like, for example, uh, Brazil, run by Trump's buddy uh, Bolsonaro, which again yeah. is in that elite club that's handled it even sure. worse than the United but States. But the truth is, you don't actually know why 10, countries are, are, are less than are 10 severely countries infected. In the world. Well, well actually, not. I think that the approach that's been shown to be most effective, and I feel for James because I know that he's trying to get us off this, but the approach <laughs> that's been shown to be the most effective is serious lockdown use that time to set up a national test and trace program which absolutely mm -hmm. could and should have been done in the united states completely useless what, what about india why is india not doesn't they're like one of the poorest countries in the world everybody's packed together all, all over the place there why do they not have a severe problem because the, what because, did they do that was so amazing okay well for actually india had a really hard line national lockdown very early Darling. could you get me coffee please thank you sorry Sorry for the interruption. I didn't mean for that to be vocalized on the show. <laughs> no problem. James, what, what do you, uh, I, 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 I feel bad. I, I know. That <laughs> no, 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 oh, okay. Bad. That's true. That's uh, true. We, we can, we can shift. We, can shift. <laughs> uh, we, we, other possible topics and some of these didn't come up in the, uh, opening. So I'm just throwing them out there. Election integrity, whether or not the, uh, whether or not there is something to debate there. Maybe you guys are actually not particularly worried there i'm worried but i don't think it's i don't think there's much to debate about it how about let's see i mean i th i think i think that i think that there there is something to debate uh in doing uh in the way that republicans all around the country have been going out of their way to make it more difficult to vote because they know that the fewer people who vote the better chance their guy has Hence, using uh, worries totally lacking any evidential basis in reality about widespread voter fraud as an excuse to try to make it as difficult as possible to vote, doing things like having only one uh, ballot collection site per county in Texas, mm -hmm. where individual counties are larger than a lot of states are. Uh, I, I think that every time something is in contention in court around the country, uh, where the the two sides are disagreeing about some Something question of election funny. law, it's always a matter of Republicans trying to make sure fewer people vote. It's harder to vote because they know that that's the way that Trump has the best chance of being. First of all, Trump isn't doing that specifically, so you can't blame Trump for that. Uh, secondly, I do actually think it's better for Republicans if fewer people vote. Generally, uh, not not necessarily because of you know voters. I mean, I don't think voter suppression has anything to do with it. But I do think that uh, people who are uninformed about politics should not vote, right? If you're not, if you don't take the time to actually inform yourself about the issues and figure out, you know, where you actually stand, just voting because you think that it's your patriotic duty or something, I think is actually a terrible idea. And we should discourage people from voting if they haven't actually educated themselves. Um, I don't think that we should create any kind of barrier to voting. And I don't know anyone who does. There's this myth that Republicans are constantly trying to create voter suppression, especially amongst black Americans. This is just patently false. Um, if, you, if you talk about like voter ID laws and things like that, uh, efforts to stop voter fraud, which I think are totally and completely reasonable, and they have them in most other countries, uh, first world countries. Uh, you need license to get on the plane, things like that, uh, state ID. Um, this idea that, oh, black people have a much harder time to get ID than white people. I mean, what the hell are they talking about? Well, what, what is the, I don't even understand that at all. Like, I mean, most of the people, when I go to the DMV, and granted I live in LA, almost everybody that works there is black. So are black DMV employees stopping black Americans from getting ID all over the place. I don't understand this. Having an ID well, at a voting booth does not limit your ability to vote. It's insane. Well, first of all, uh, the whole point, the only reason, given the absolute lack of evidence uh, for any sort of widespread voter fraud mm -hmm. that actually places states that have really tried to look into this and really tried to find every case uh, will maybe get into the single digits uh, of cases. So the reason for the ID requirements isn't to solve this non-existent problem. The reason is that anytime you can have, you know, you can have any kind of hurdle, right? An extra form you have to fill out, an extra box you have to check, an extra anything that you have to do, you know that fewer people will do it 
uh, as with anything, right? That they have a uh, that that's exactly the kind of thing that Republicans will bring up when they are advocating like small business deregulation, because uh, because anytime that you're making people go through extra steps, fill out extra forms, etc., and the people who are the least likely to jump through extra hoops, well, first of all, the people who are least likely to have ID in the first place are people who are lower down on the socioeconomic spectrum. Uh, and those are also the people the least likely to have the free time and energy to show, uh, jump through any hoops uh, that, uh, that, you, uh, that you give them. But I am glad that you brought up the fact that uh, there are so many non-white employees at the, uh, at the DMV, uh, because while we're talking about efforts uh, to make it harder to vote, even aside from the really obvious stuff, uh, like you know what the Republicans are doing in Texas, and you're right. This is not Donald Trump personally doing these things. Uh, this is his party doing it uh, throughout the entire country. But they have a. But it is absolutely true that those good public sector jobs, like the DMV or, oh, say, the post office that Donald Trump has also really tried to undermine, uh, have been massive drivers of upward mobility, especially for Black Americans, which is one of the reasons that it's so insidious that Trump and the Republicans want there to be less funding for those things and want to scale them back and have even openly floated the idea of privatizing the Postal Service. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> I think it would be fantastic. Uh, uh, you're right, you're right. I don't, here, here's the thing. Um, there is no real reason why anyone shouldn't be able to get an ID, and the idea that Republicans are trying to suppress the vote of, of Black Americans is just an absurd lie. Uh, but I would say this. Um, most violent crimes go unsolved in America, right? There are lots of different kinds of crimes that happen. And some crimes have a high rate of uh, closure, uh, you know, uh, rate of being solved by police. And other crimes have a very low rate of being solved by cre uh, police. A lot of crimes go undetected, right? Now, violent crimes naturally are going to be detected. Why is that? Because there's, a, there's an obvious victim who is going to be outraged or upset by it and is very likely going to report it. We don't know exactly how easy it is to commit voter fraud. We don't, we don't have any idea how much voter fraud goes on that goes undetected. The fact that we detect any voter fraud is kind of impressive, actually. And because it's a very difficult thing to figure out. It's a very difficult thing to detect a lot of the time, given the methods that they use. If you don't know about the methods of voter fraud, look at a New York Post uh, article entitled, entitled, I was a, I was a, I, something like I was a voter fraud or something like that. You got to check that out. Fantastic right. article about, by somebody talked, you know, uh, about somebody who admits that he was a Bernie supporter. Uh, he was a political operative and he admits that he engaged in voter fraud. He talks about some of the techniques and these techniques, you would not be able to detect them. You would not be able to detect the crime. And therefore they will, a lot of these crimes will go undetected. You know how you could stop those crimes from occurring voter id right so it's not about the evidence i mean there is evidence to, to suggest that some voter fraud exists but it's about common sense it's about saying okay this is a crime that's very difficult to detect voter id would help stop this or curtail this there to, to just argue that against it because you're assuming that there's some kind of racial intention is an absurdity there's no evidence Evidence to suggest that I want voter ID laws put in place because I hate black people. That's just unbelievably stupid. It's a, it's a ridiculous, disingenuous argument. Okay. Well, first of all, note that at this point you're arguing with things that I haven't said. You're arguing with things that other. No, people but these are these are the positions else, elsewhere, that are generally taken has, against uh, us. Have, 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 said, have said. Yeah. But well, since you brought it up, right? What is uh, what is the link there? Well, again, uh, the people least likely to have ID in the first place uh, are going to be very poor people you know people who are not uh, who are not which are mostly or, white by the way uh, ten, yes are mostly white but as you and i you may recall have discussed extensively in the past uh that uh they are disproportionate wildly disproportionately black mostly white but wildly disproportionate yeah, but we don't black. count votes based on a, proportion of a population no, we, no, we count votes we in total but if you are doing something that's going to make it less likely uh, mm -hmm. that people in a group that is wildly disproportionately black uh, are going are, are going to vote. One of the reasons that would be very much in the interests of the GOP uh, is because they know that this is one of the demographics that most overwhelming. Sure, but you still have to assume the motivation. 
I'm honestly not super interested. Uh, I think that in the motivation, I think that they would have to be very, uh, very slow to not get that this connection served their interests. Perhaps they don't care about that. Uh, but I would, uh, I would think that they do. The point, I don't. I think that the question is okay. Uh, the question is, uh, is it? Um, the question is, how are we going to weigh? this alleged problem of in-person voter fraud that you know you have one anecdote in the new york post you have decades of attempts to study this and find cases that have turned up almost nothing uh, how are you going to weigh this against the fact that we all know that every time you put up a new hoop to doing something fewer people are going to do it and the people uh, the fewer people who are going to do it are more likely to be the people who are poorest oftentimes uh have uh you know have the uh, have transportation issues uh people we're talking about people who don't have driver's license in the first place uh people who um who are likely to be working uh exhausting menial jobs uh where they're they're less likely uh to uh, to spend their free time jumping through the uh, through your hoops uh so if you know that a predictable consequence of making it harder for people to vote is that fewer of those people are going to vote and what you have to weigh this against is the alleged problem mm -hmm. of in-person voter fraud sure is it possible that there's a plague of in-person voter fraud that just hasn't shown up uh in any statistical evidence that we have available i guess i mean it's possible that there's an invisible leprechaun on the palm of my hand right now uh that's undetectable by any means that we figured out to detect right now the question is do we have a good reason to think that that's the case well, the leprechaun's name is Gerald, and he's been spying on you for weeks, okay? Oh. Just putting that out there. That's but, disturbing. okay, here, what is the likelihood that it's going to uh, significantly reduce the number of voters who desperately want to vote uh, but just can't because of who the... Who desperately want to vote or uh, or who would otherwise vote? Because those who are two other... very different questions. Well, well, I think this is actually critical because I don't want people voting who aren't desperate to vote. I don't want people who are uneducated about politics and political issues to go vote. So I'm perfectly fine if there are certain people who would sort of cavalierly go vote just because, you know, it's easy for them. I would be perfectly fine. I, I would actually put it to you. Would you be happier if uneducated people, people who are uneducated about politics specifically and the issues and they don't really know anything about the candidates and they don't really know anything about the issues, would you rather have them voting in America or not? Because they definitely help the, the left. They well, definitely help no, Democrats. They, 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 they don't. Uh, certainly, oh, they do. They do. Oh, no, no, they don't. Because if you look at uh, if you look at the actual studies that have been uh, have been done on this, for example, I'm looking. I okay, know, so then you should I, be I, fine. I, I, then I you know, should be fine know, with, with, know, with voter suppression. Then you should be trying well, to create no, voter suppression. Well, notice that you're 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 making a really crucial assumption here, uh -huh. which uh -huh. is that the people who are most likely to be deterred are also going to be uninformed. Yes. Whereas. I think that's not true. I think that mm. the people who are most likely to be uh, to uh, to be deterred, what's that going to what that's going to try uh, what's what's that going to track uh, if is not level of information, uh, it's financial level. And you might say, oh, those two are probably going to be the same anyway. Uh, but uh, that's not what the data that we have seems to indicate. So, for example, we all know that the Republican base tilts higher income uh, than uh, than the Democratic base. Uh, mm that you know uh trump uh, that trump voters for for example despite all the talk of the white working class and everything else after the election tilted higher income let, uh, let me just jump in here for a quick second because I, I want to make a distinction i don't necessarily think it'll be poorer voters i or I, I think that it'll be less passionate voters okay but if less passionate voters mm -hmm. who have more free time who have better access to transportation etc cetera, etc cetera, are going to be more likely to vote than less passionate voters who have to work all the time who don't have as easy access to transportation who don't have as much free time so it's not that oh we're getting the less passionate voters we're getting the more passionate voters and not the less passionate voters it's that higher up the income ladder we're getting both the more passionate voters and the ones who are just barely passionate enough. But the lower you go down the income chain, the more you need to have a higher level of passion to jump through all these hoops. And it's not at all the case 
uh, that uh, that poor voters are necessarily going to be less informed. So, for example, like I said, we know that no, the I agree with that. Yeah, the but the more informed you are, the more likely you are, you are to really want to vote. Tends to tilt higher income. Uh, but I'm looking, and and don't worry, James, I'm, I'm not bringing this up to, to redirect the subject. Oh, no, I'm, coronavirus. Not, not you got to bring up coronavirus. <laughs> but I'm looking, for example, at a headline here in the Minneapolis Post about a study showing that, I quote, people who rely on conservative media for COVID-19 news are less informed, more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. They're, sure. similar, they're similarly less. What, 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 are, what, what so uh, publication a, is that? What publication is that? The Minneapolis Post. All right, I don't know. So they have they, a, I'm uh, sure they're leftists. Uh, well, okay, sure. I mean, that's that's an easy way to dismiss everything. But they have a uh, and similarly. <laughs> I mean, come on, am I wrong? Sim similarly, well, yeah, actually, you are, you you are wrong. They might be feckless, centrist, corporate liberals, but they are they're certainly not leftists. But in any case, I think that there are also studies showing that people uh, who uh, who who watch Fox tend to uh, tend to be less informed, tend to do worse on simple multiple choice factual questions uh, asked by pollsters. That's that actually not who, true. That's actually not true. You can look up, yeah. you can look up, uh, this is a Pew study that they stopped doing, I think in 2013 um, or something like that. Maybe it might've been even earlier than that. They used to do this study on uh, how informed voters are on the issues. And I think conservatives, I think beat uh, le liberals or leftists on literally every issue, I think except one. I think it was something like uh, ecological issues, environmental issues, things like that. But on almost every other issue, Republicans always beat, every single time they do one of these studies, always beat Democrats on their knowledge of the issues. So you're, it's just patently false what you're saying. Okay, what you just said uh, is not true. So I'm looking, for example, uh, at a... Um, at a digital art, uh, journal article uh, from a few years ago, it says new study by Bruce Bartlett, a conservative economist, top official in the George H.W. Bush administration and domestic policy advisor to Ronald Reagan concluded that Fox News viewers tend to be less informed. Uh, and again- And, wh and what, was the, what was the method of that study? So uh, the 18 page study uh, titled How Fox News Changed American uh, Media and Political Dynamics, uh, the proponents uh, and again, these people are conservatives, they're proponents of supply side economics, uh, found uh, that uh, Fox viewers tend to be less informed about current affairs than people who follow other news sources, the study observed, sorry, I'm just scrolling down here. But, you know, obviously, this is something that I just looked at, but this is not something that I was just guessing that I would find, right? I've, I've right. seen I've seen this reported many times before. Now, maybe this isn't it's very, very I mean, okay. fake news from, you know, left-wing media sources, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly not a novel claim. There have been several studies over the years that have shown that Fox viewers are less informed than, uh, than <laughs> viewers of other kinds of media. Fox viewers, it's so sad. Uh, okay, the truth is that it is somewhat difficult to get accurate statistics uh, in a basic search on Google. And the reason is because the vast majority of media outlets are left wing. Google is left wing. There is a lot of data suppression going on. There's a lot of information suppression going on by social media, uh, by uh, media outlets like the New York Times who are becoming far more left wing. And you know, I asked Valeria the other day, what, uh, how, what percentage of Russians believed in communism, right? An obviously failed uh, political system. And she's, you know, back during the Soviet Union. And she said, all of them, they all believed that communism was the way forward. How could you convince an entire country that a political system that is destined to collapse, destined to fail, is the correct way forward? Well, the reason, the way that you do this is suppression of information. That is how you do it, okay? If people only have a certain data set, if they only have certain information that they're getting, false information, bad information, and you're, you're restricting all this good information, they have no idea what the other options are. Yeah, I think, I think that is an, a, a pitch perfect description of what Fox News is like. <laughs> okay, come on. Fox News is like an oasis in a desert. All right, it's the only really mainstream media news organization that is even remotely right wing. Every other media outlet is left wing. And it may not be left wing to your standards, but it is left wing. Oh, it, would be, it would be left wing by, by any standards. It might be socially liberal, right? But it's, it's certainly not economically left wing. It's certainly not left wing on foreign policy. If you actually want to know what the biases of the media are, 
uh, then a really good basic reading source would be Noam Chomsky and Edward Herbin's book, classic book, Manufacturing Consent, no, uh, where they where they break down uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the numbers on this. Uh, but I think that as uh, I think that when it comes to things like portrayal of American foreign policy and its victims, when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, when it when it comes to economic <clears throat> issues, left wing, not a chance. Now, if all you mean is not so you know is socially liberal uh relatively friendly to uh to equality for gay people probably vote for democrats sure right i think that describes you know that describes quite a bit of the mainstream media but i think that if you want to know where and you know the and i think that it's gotten uh the media landscape as a whole uh has gotten worse because uh because it's gotten um because we're in a media landscape now where people can pick and choose a buffet of news. I wish they that, could. That, I that, wish they that, could. That confirm their, confirm their own biases uh, and they don't have to expose themselves to news sources that don't. I think Matt Taibbi's book, uh, Hate Inc. is uh, is very good on this. So it's very, very easy uh, if, uh, if you're a conservative uh, to only consume uh, can uh, conservative tilted news? It's yeah, also that, very, that's, very that's, easy that's, if you're liberal sure. to only, only to, to only. People consume. are selectively biased. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But here's a, here's the question I, I I want to pose to you right now because I think this is actually very critical. Do you actually think that conservatives should be free to express themselves on YouTube, on Twitter, on social media? Yeah, I do. I think everybody should feel free. Should be free to express themselves in those places. I think that the I think that the evidence. Uh, for uh, for for systematic uh, suppression, particularly uh, of conservatives, is overblown and depends on overblown. I think overwhelming is the answer that you're looking for. Uh, extremely overblown. Oh my uh, god! Based, Are based, you kidding me? Based based on wild cherry picking of the ben, evidence. I think you got to look into this. For, for, you got to look every, into this. Oh, trust me, I've looked into it for every case you can come up with. My um, case, I have been suppressed for months. Months, yeah, ever since I came out with my Gillette video, my numbers have been dismal. And in fact, actually, in September, I think, they released me because my numbers are in, are, are I think they've like tripled or something like that in September. And I'm fine. And you know what happened in late August? Trump went to the FCC and asked them to look into regulating the, uh, the social media companies, including Google, including Twitter. Google owns YouTube. And suddenly we find that conservatives are now a lot more free to express themselves. I think I'm probably still suppressed to some degree, but not like I was. I mean, the suppression was ridiculous. There's something called a click-through rate, okay? A, a click-through rate, impression by, by impression, right? So you have a certain number of impressions. That's the, the amount that uh, uh, Google, YouTube will show your videos to people, right? Like uh, if you get shown, you know, 100 videos, you pick one, right? Uh, no, however many people that video is shown to, however often they click, that's your click-through rate. So if 100 people are shown your video and five people click on your video, you know, of all the videos that they're shown, then that gives you, uh, you know, a point of those 100. And I was getting click-through rates of something like 30%, okay, 30%. And my videos were still getting something like 50,000 views. It was ridiculous. I had a friend who has a similar number of subscribers and she would get 5% click-through rate and she, her videos would get something like 200,000 uh, views. Uh, the, 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 it was ridiculous. The suppression was so, very so, obvious. So, so, so far you've talked about two individual cases the question is and honestly sure, I these are anecdotal I, 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 sure. I, I, I don't think now i think that when conservatives put forward this narrative i don't think they're being dishonest i just don't think they know what they're talking about because yeah. they <laughs> they know well how then how they, then they, am they, i getting they, they, then they, am i getting hundreds know, of thousands of views know, on on a seven percent click-through rate they, today they know, when i was know, getting fifty thousand views on a on a thirty percent click through know, rate in they august know about their experience in times yeah. when youtube for example has screwed them over they know about i talked to i talked to leftists and they don't have this so, problem uh, okay, I think you don't talk to enough leftists. Uh, I think that if you want examples of YouTube uh, deplatforming people, for example, uh, there are tons of examples uh, that that happen on the left. It's happened to me. Uh, that's so they have, of course. Uh, I think that there are cases. This is the part I agree with yeah. you on, right? There are cases uh, where YouTube, Twitter, uh, other uh, other other platforms like this uh, have. Uh, have deep, you know, have deplatformed uh, conservatives uh, mm -hmm. in ways that I find disturbing. Uh, I think that having a few 
giant uh, for-profit corporations have this much control over the flow of information uh, is, uh, is, is a very bad idea. I guess if I were a conservative or libertarian, I think they could do whatever they want with their property, but I'm not. Uh, so I actually do have a problem with that. There have also been cases uh, when they have done that to leftists. I agree. Not, I agree I've, with that. I've, I will I've say cer that. certainly not seen uh, statistical information leading me to think uh, that it actually happens mostly uh, in the one direction. Well, I didn't prepare but, for this, so but, I can't but, give you but, that. But how, I assure how, you, it is mostly happening. To okay, I, I don't think it does. I think that I think that people have actually looked into this, have not come to that conclusion. But look, as far as the issue of principle, uh, should platforms like YouTube uh, have much less fuzzy rules, much more clearly stated rules that uh, have much more due process to them. Uh, so you have to get a clear explanation, for example, if a video is taken down, uh, that you have a meaningful right to appeal it, et cetera, none of which exists now. Absolutely. Do I think these rules should be a total free for all? You can post anything that you want. No, I think there are reasonable restrictions. I, I agree with you. But, but, but I, think they I think they should err much more on the side of free Freedom. speech than they do now. Yeah, yeah, so then, okay, so then there is at least one point in which you agree with Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is working hard behind the scenes uh, with the FCC, with Congress, to try to convince or, or at least pressure, uh, pressure or at least convince uh, the social media companies to be more uh, uh, free or, or allow more expression on their platforms. So, so you do actually, you, you, you should then give Trump a little bit of credit then for pushing that when I haven't heard a single Democrat come out to, uh, you know, against these social media companies who are inappropriately suppressing speech. Well, I, I think that, I think that what Trump has done. Well, what would uh, Biden do? Forget Trump. What would Biden do? What, would Biden what has Biden do? said on this? What has Biden said on this? What has Kamala Harris said on this? What has Pelosi said on this? What is the left going to do when they get into office okay, okay, to okay. ensure that we have free speech? Okay, two things. One, nothing. What is Trump doing? Meaningfully, nothing. They have Not a, true. Uh, Not true. Absolutely true. They have a, uh, and also, of course, the really absurd thing you just said was Pelosi, Harris, Biden, and the left. Get out uh -huh. more, man. Talk to some leftists. Ask them what they think about these people. Uh -huh. You will not get rave reviews. No, I, I actually agree with that. But if you're voting, if we're talking about who needs to be elected in uh, uh, November, I think you, you've just completely undercut your position because those well, are the people that are going to be in control of the country if we to, don't vote in Donald Trump. Yes, those are the people who can be in control of the country. And so the question is about the comparative choice, right, which is what I've been arguing all along, that, of course, I think Biden sucks. I tried very hard to stop him from getting the uh, from getting the nomination, but elections are about comparative choices. Uh -huh. And if we are going to compare uh, what Trump has done in the last few years to what was being done before that, what would likely happen in a Biden administration? If your number one issue uh, is uh, is looking at what's going on, uh, what's going on with YouTube? Uh, do I think, by the way, that Trump is going to do anything that's actually going to get YouTube to do what I just advocated, have clear, consistent rules with a clear appeals process, et cetera? Not really. I think that he's going to make a lot of noises about uh, conservatives being suppressed, which, again, I'm not at all convinced that the evidence supports that as the predominant direction. Uh, but I don't think he's going to do that. But even if he was going to do that, look, is what happens on YouTube more important or less important than, forgive me, James, the handling of the coronavirus plague. Is <laughs> the on YouTube more and this important is, I mean, I will give you this. Or, the, or, the coronavirus thing is your best tack, is, but it's is, still well, weak. Well, you'll notice it's not, the, it's not the tack that I started with. It's not even as astounding as I think it is that you're sitting you here keep saying, funneling down into say, it. Say, saying with a straight face uh, that uh, 213,000 Americans dying. When, would all those deaths have been prevented? No. Would most of them have been prevented by a better approach? Of course. No. But Come I on. don't even think Come on. Uh, that, that that's, you'll notice that's not even the issue that I've emphasized yeah. in my opening statement, right? The, uh, the issue that I emphasized, the issue that I started with was Donald Trump's assault on the institutions, the only institutions that have actually been able to raise wages, 
get better working conditions, give any kind of voice or power at the workplace to the American working class. And if the question is, uh, am I more concerned with how easy is it to organize a union uh, so you can make a living wage, so you can get proper PPE during, uh, during a pandemic? Am I more concerned with that issue or am I more concerned with what's going on on YouTube? That's a very easy call for me. We At the end of the day, will... sorry, go on. It might be a good opportunity to jump into the Q&A if you guys are up for Yeah, it. yeah, absolutely, sure. sure. I'll, I'll let him finish with that. I, I, okay, it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very it's, weak it's, position. It's, it's, well, okay. Uh, I think, I think. I think it's obvious to everyone it's a weak position. Okay, so well, I don't I, think I, they have I, to I, respond. I, I, I wish we could take an instant poll. That would not be my guess. You wanted to jump to questions? Oh, my here? God. Dude, James, you have to have instant polls. You got to figure that out. That's true. We, we could do that. I don't know if they're, I mean, they're not Blaming random. Blaming Trump but... for the coronavirus is the weakest, but... most pathetic position you could possibly have. Yeah. Trump, Trump, ha Trump has done everything that he thought was necessary. You, 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 he, uh, Fauci was asked in Congress, you know, what did Trump do compared to what the, the medical community had told him, what the experts had told him to do? Yeah. And Fauci was like, Trump did everything we advised him to do. So yeah. this idea that Trump doesn't listen to experts, that Trump didn't do things right. Yeah, guy, the guy, the guy, 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 who, guy who works for him, guy who would lose his ability to have any control or guidance about this whatsoever yeah. if he were honest about this. That's about as shocking as a Soviet bureaucrat saying that the five-year plan You think is, that Fauci going, has definitely criticized is, Trump. Is, you is think going, that Fauci is, going, is in Trump's pocket? I think that there are limits to what he's going to say in those circumstances. There are limits no, no, to what he was, anybody, he was testifying anybody to Congress. It wasn't his, like he was being interviewed in, his, in a softball in his, interview. Yes, he was testifying to Congress. But I think that there are limits on what anybody in his position are going to say under those circumstances. Oh, that's, oh, come I think, on. I think, your your I think, response I think to, you, this, to this I th point I th is, oh, well, I, I don't think, believe I think it. All let's, you've let's got is what, is, what, is what one, what Fauci says and uh -huh. you're going to ignore the uh -huh. overwhelming evidence from the comparisons between the United States and Canada, the United States. Well, by and the European Trump Union. is not an epidemiologist. They only a, do what the experts tell him to do, man. Uh huh. I, I think that it's overwhelmingly clear. Biden was asked. The, Biden was asked what you would do response, differently. The U.S. response to the coronavirus has been among the very worst. Sure. Yeah, you in can blame Cuomo for that. Look, look, look Biden was asked what he would have disaster. done differently, and literally everything that he said in that interview were things Trump had done. There's no difference between what the Democrats would have done and what Trump did based on the evidence of what Trump did. Would, what would they have done had Trump not been there? Probably a lot worse of a job. But it's impossible well, to know because they weren't there. Based, well, that's based on literally nothing. And, it, and, if, and if we look at the fact that that with very few exceptions, fewer than 10 exceptions, every other country in the world handled it better, I Not think that, I, well, no, I mean, that is just a fact. Look at rate you of can't, cases. You can't rate look of at the United States as deaths, a whole. Look, look at the deaths per cases versus the leftist reasons. I hate to reasons. interrupt, guys. I hate okay, to let's do, do the Q and A. Pardon my interruption, but just to jump into it's these It's the questions. leftist governors, the leftist governors. It's their fault. I love these. If you <laughs> believe that there are leftist governors in the United States, you're I do. Yeah. Fantasy I world. Like you said, James. I love your guys' passion. It makes it fun. <laughs> it makes it exciting. And so this has been a really, really enjoyable one. We Wait till you see the fist fight questions. afterwards. That's going to be crazy. That's right. It will be barbaric. <laughs> but uh, we uh, want to remind you that both of our guests Dr. Ben Burgess, I, forgive me, Ben. I think I, I butchered your name earlier. So sorry about that. And so thanks okay, for your patience. And Mr. Reagan, both of them are linked in the description, folks, so that you can hear plenty more where this came from. And so with that, Net7, we've got a Joe Jorgensen supporter here. It says, mm -hmm. Joe, not Joe Biden. In other words, Joe Jorgensen. <laughs> they say, dump Trump, vote Joe Jorgensen November 3rd say no to democratic socialism and no to i'm embarrassed to say this can you guys what is paleo conservatism uh that means like pat buchanan style conservatism like it's mostly as opposed to neoconservatism like you know people who are supporting the war in iraq things like that so uh, paleo conservatism is like the wing of conservatism that tends to be more isolationist about foreign policy yeah, more which i would actually say trump fits into et cetera. A oh I in some ways yeah that's, I feel like, is that the new slang now, Ben? I don't know. <laughs> no, but, it's not slang. It's, 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 it's been around for a while? Uh, it's been around for a while, but I feel like it hasn't actually been used nearly as much lately as it was back in like the early 2000s. Oh, okay. Well, 
Okay, thank you so That's much good. for that. And Marcos Mekoev says TVP. Check it out. Is this another slang thing? What is TVP? That one. I, I actually don't know that. Okay, mm. well, I used to be hip. All right, Matthew W. Thanks to your <laughs> question. Never says, thank you, Mr. Reagan, for your vigorous defense of Trump. So you have a, a supporter out there, a Trump supporter as well. Thank you, sir. Thank Brenton you, sir. Brenton Langle. Ah, Brenton, glad to hear from you. Brenton said, there is no major leftist media in America, Mr. Reagan. You only have Democracy Now! and maybe The Intercept. Most well, we're just talking, this centrist. is semantics. Oh, one sec. They said most others right. are centrist or far right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just perspective, right? I mean, any Marxist is going to look at the American left and say you're far right. But it's, it's I mean, it's an absurdity. I, I think that, I'll tell you what, we, we, are a, we are a capitalist nation. So in the sense that if you want to look at full-on communism as the farthest left that you can go, then we're right wing in that sense because we're not Marxist, we're, we're, uh, we're capitalist. Um, but typically Americans look at the left right divide within the capitalist framework. And once you go past the capitalist framework into say, you know, you know, the, these Marxist ideas, then you're going further left than most Americans accept as the left in America. But a, a Marxist will certainly be correct from his perspective or from her perspective in saying that an American, you know, left, you know, left wing liberal politician is probably more right wing in their minds than, you know, than left wing. But we're looking at just, two just, different just, scales. Just, we're, we're looking at two different scales. Just it's one your, very quick, very yeah, quick sorry, point about this. You don't have to go all the way to full communism uh, to have the perspective uh, that, that I'm just giving a different that, measurement. That, 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 I'm just giving that, the, the well, sure, well, sure, but but here's here's a third measurement you could look at. Sure. Right? You could you could think about uh, things like in countries like like Canada, right? Which, as far as I know, is 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 not a communist nation. Uh, even uh, even the Conservative Party uh, supports uh, keeping uh, the their Medicare system, national health insurance, uh, which is uh, roughly what Bernie Sanders advocates in this country. In the UK. Uh, even the conservatives have to at least say, even if they'll undermine it in various ways, that they support keeping the National Health Service, which goes way further than what Bernie advocates, to actually nationalizing the hospitals and having government doctors be government employees. So I'd say there's an international perspective, even within the boundaries of capitalism. These are all capitalist countries we're talking about, from the perspective of which uh, the American Democratic Party uh, is very far from left wing. Gotcha. And next, appreciate your question. This one comes in from Adam Friended, who says, <laughs> <laughs> I, had a feeling I, I, you I have, I, I, I have had a conversation with Adam Friended. In the past. I had a feeling you guys had, had I have no idea who before. this is. He says, why not limit voting to the smartest people? Smart people make the best decisions. That's why planned economies work so well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so so I think Adam could have paid a little bit more attention uh, during our uh, during our conversation, uh, and he uh, he might learn uh, that uh, that the the sort of Soviet model of of marketless planned economy uh, is uh, is not at all uh, the uh, the sort of thing that I advocate. If you want to know what I advocate, you can uh, you can read uh, an article that I wrote a few months ago in Jacobin called uh, "Capitalism Isn't Working," but uh, what would uh, you know? What would a viable socialism look like, or something like that? Uh, but as to uh, as to his other point uh, about uh, about limiting uh, voting to uh, to the smartest people, um, in fact, my you know what I advocate economically is exactly the opposite of that, right? I want worker-owned firms where everybody uh, can can have a say, not just a few state planners. But as far as uh, limited voting to uh, to the smartest people, I'd say that when we actually look at the history of of attempts to limit the franchise based on some sort of test allegedly for uh, for intelligence. Uh, I'd say that that's not a particularly honorable history, not one that inspires confidence about what such a thing would look like uh, in, uh, in the future. And I don't even think that it led to uh, the people who are allowed to vote being more intelligent. Gotcha, and thank you for this question. This one comes in from Marcos McKeve, let me know if I mispronounced it, Marcos. Thanks for your question. Said information suppression is going on by the United States government on whoever they want and upon what they want, not what you think. 
I think I lost the thread. I, I, me too. <laughs> I have no idea what that. So can you read it again? They said, I, I'm kind of just as confused as you. Okay, they said, okay. Information suppression is going on by the United States government on whoever they want and upon what they want, not what you think. I think it, we have a lot of conspiracy theorists. Okay, <laughs> Mark, okay. I'm sorry, Marcos, we love you. I, I just don't know what you meant. I'm sure, he, well, I'm sure what he's saying makes sense. I just, the way it's, t yeah. sometimes you type something and it doesn't come out clearly. You yeah, know, I do that sometimes. Yeah, I do that I, well, sometimes. I'm sure. I'm sure we all do. Yeah. But I, I guess, I guess, I'd say I, I'm not entirely sure what he's referring to with uh, with information suppression. Although this is as good a time as any to mention that uh, if you are concerned about information suppression and freedom of the press, uh, sign up the, for Mr. Reagan on YouTube. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> or uh, take a look at the uh, the Trump administration's uh, prosecution of Julian Assange, which is one of the most disturbing assaults on freedom of the press in a very long time. I, I will stand up uh, with you on that. I do think that Julian Assange does need to be freed, but I would not put that exclusively on the Trump administration, and I think you would not agree with that. No. Yeah. I agree. Gotcha. And thanks so much for this question. This <clears throat> one comes in from RT96. RT says, 2012 study, People who get their news from Fox are less informed than people who don't pay attention to the news at all. Is that a real study? I remember that. Uh, I, I certainly, look, I won't claim that I have done a deep dive into what the methodology was or anything like that, but uh, I do remember seeing that back then, yes. Fascinating. And well, blue, wait, wait, can you read it again? I didn't, I didn't hear it, actually. They said 20, study done in 2012 said people who get their news from Fox are less informed than people who don't pay attention to the news at all. Uh, well, I don't, I don't understand what this obsession is with Fox viewers. If you look at <laughs> studies that talk about Republicans, right, versus Democrats, Republicans in every study I've seen are far better informed about politics specifically. Now, you'll find that leftists or people who vote Democrat tend to be better educated in terms of uh, you know, specialties, things like that. They tend to be more doctors, tend to be more, uh, you know, people with advanced degrees, better educated generally or in specific career areas. But when it comes to politics and political knowledge, Republicans win every single time. Hands down, no question. Every study says it. Look it up. Anybody who is curious about that should look that up. Got All right. Well, they, uh, I guess uh, the Republicans who don't watch Fox know so much that they make up for all the ones who do. <laughs> all Republicans watch Fox. Let's be realistic. And thank you for <laughs> your question. This one comes in from Blue Heron. Good to see you. Said, Reagan, if the official election result is a Trump loss, mm -hmm. will you accept the results of the election or help to keep Trump in power? Yeah, this is kind of like this weird myth that Trump uh, will refuse to step down if he loses. Uh, that's never really been Trump's position. Trump's position is that he is concerned that there may be voter fraud. And if the results indicate a Biden win, but there also is some kind of an indication of you know, massive voter fraud or some kind of significant cheating in the election, then obviously Trump will take some kind of um, – uh, action to try to look into that between the time that the election takes place and the time that uh, obviously has to leave office, which is in January, I think January 15th. So it's not that Trump has refused to leave office no matter what. It's simply that there is a concern. And he, uh, you know, it's this is a logical fallacy, which Ben Burgess can uh, explain probably better than I can. But this idea that to say that uh, I will not uh, agree to do something is not the same as saying I will refuse to do something, right? So they're saying, will you immediately agree no matter what the, um, no matter what the, uh, out like if the outcome is that Biden wins, will you uh, agree right now that wh whatever the outcome is, you will accept it immediately on election day, right? And Trump's like, I, I don't know yet. We have to find out. We have to see what happens. And I think that everybody would agree, Ben Burgess would agree, that if there is you know, some kind of obvious indication that there has been massive voter fraud, that whoever is in office should not concede immediately, concede, uh, concede the election the day of the election if there is some kind of evidence of that. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'll take Trump's position uh, you know, every single day and I'll defend Obama. I'll defend Biden. I'll defend uh, Clinton, I'll defend anyone who happens to be elected uh, if they don't want to step down, if there's an indication of massive voter fraud. But uh, I don't think that there probably will be 
I, I think that probably if uh, if Biden wins, then it'll probably look like a fair election. And then in that case, Trump should step down. Um, I don't actually think it's going to happen. I think Trump's going to win. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I don't I think this is a non issue. This is some kind of like myth to scare Democrat voters. A lot of points that Democrats make are simply to scare or outrage Democrat voters to keep them from thinking and so, to just so, keep you guys so, afraid. So where, where might this myth come from? Uh, could it be the fact that uh, quite consistently when he's asked or when Pence was asked at the vice presidential debate mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the other night, uh, would there be a peaceful transfer of power if you lost? They did not in fact say what you just said. Right? They have a. No, they, uh, they did say exactly what I said. They, they, they said exactly what I said. I, dude, I just watched this. That's not what mm -hmm. Pence said at it. Right? He what did he say? What did he say? He conspicuously spent two minutes not answering the question. Uh, they, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of that also from Harris. Don't get me wrong, right? But I think that that was a particularly disturbing one, uh, not uh, not to answer. Uh, and I think that if Trump had in fact uh, said uh, said what you said. Uh, then it would be far less of a story. Uh, instead, I think when asked like the easiest softball question of all time, right, which is, uh, which is, if the election doesn't go your way, uh, would, uh, would, would you accept, uh, would you accept the result? Uh, it it costs nothing. It does That's not an easy question. Say, That's not an easy question. To say, if to you say, want to say what I just yes, said. Yes, of course. Uh, right. They have, uh, if you, and but I think that if you go back and look at those transcripts, I don't think that Trump is saying, I know for damn sure Pence didn't say the other night, uh, well, I will unless there is clear evidence of massive voter but fraud. But Trump has said that although, in other interviews. Although, of course, there's also uh, the idea that there would be evidence of massive voter fraud is just nonsense. It's based well, but, but hold on, on Ben, Ben, look, if you're looking at an array of answers, of responses, right? And you just ignore the in-depth responses and you only focus on the ones that look like he was equivocating or something like that. And you say, oh, because he didn't give full answers here, uh, it's unclear. And you just ignore the clarifications that he's made. I mean, sure, you could, you could make the case that uh, uh, Trump is, you know, going to try to steal the election or not uh, accept the results or something like that. But he has made his position clear uh, in other interviews in depth that you're just you're just ignoring those those points. His position is basically my position. Look, you you will acknowledge, I think, that Donald Trump isn't always as well spoken as every you know as other politicians. He's not as well spoken as me, right? As as I am. He sometimes finds it difficult to express uh, specific ideas, especially in language that's understood easily by the media or by Democrats, right? Republicans tend to kind of get him, right? They kind of get understand him. And so sometimes other people need to clarify what he's saying or he needs to clarify what he's saying specifically to reporters uh, after the fact, after he's given his initial uh, response. And he's done that many times. I mean, just look at the, just look at the, uh, uh, when he was asked about, do you, can you tell the, the, the Proud Boys to stand down. First of all, Trump didn't know who the Proud Boys were. Secondly, oh, he, he said the word stand by, right? Well, stand by. Now that could be interpreted in two different ways. You could say stand by means stand by, hold on, wait until you get my signal and then go. Or it could mean, you know, that guy just stood by and didn't do anything where that woman got killed or something like that, right? So stand by can mean wait for my signal or it can mean just do nothing. It was obvious to me and to every other Republican out there that he was just reiterating what he just said, stand down in a in different language. But because oh. standby can be interpreted in another way, the media twisted it. And that's exactly yeah. what's going on here. He's not always yeah. clear with what he says. Well, you have to be able to interpret it, interpret we, what he's saying accurately. Move to the next question. I, th I think I think you have to interpret it in light of his history of pretending not to know uh, who bad actors who support him are like most that's not true that, 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 pretending well, again you're mind reading that, well, no, I'm not mind reading. Respond, mr reagan here's we do here's, here's, here's why i'm not mind reading because in 2016 when he claimed not to have heard of david duke and the kkk uh which is bizarrely implausible in the first place uh you can find plenty of statements from before 2016 showing he had indeed heard of them yeah, but but that doesn't mean that he doesn't he didn't say he'd never heard of him. He's just like, I don't I don't know anything about those people. I'm not associated with those people, which is a totally natural response for somebody who genuinely doesn't have anything to do with somebody like he was going beyond saying I denounce them. He was saying not only 
do I denounce them? I don't know anything about them. I'm not even remotely associated. It's it's the it's the when when was the last or did you stop beating your wife? It's that question, right? When did you stop beating your wife? Right? It's a very difficult question to answer. So Trump was always trying to just avoid because you're making an association in the minds of people, right? Ben Burgess, when was the did, have you stopped molesting children? Right. So now you put in the mind of people that Ben Burgess molests children. Right. That's a completely unfair thing to do. Ben Burgess, by the way, I don't believe molest children. I've never heard this accusation made. For but sure see, that. now, which is it's, it's kind of like a sick okay. thing to do. I shouldn't have used that illustration well, you, and I apologize. But nobody, the point is making that statement, put it in the minds of people. Oh, this guy's a child molester. I, I, That's I a terrible, terrible thing any, to do in, by in the media. other context, you would interpret. I don't know anything about David Duke as I yeah. repudiate him so completely mm. that I disavow having anything. No, no, to I, do I'm with saying them. Trump does not always express himself clearly, human. and that's a natural response for somebody who legitimately has nothing to do with these. People. I have okay. I, we have. I hate to do this, but Brenton Langle, thanks for your question. Said Sorry. giant corporations are not left wing. You aren't a leftist if you don't reject capitalism and private property. Corporate media and big tech love both. Sure. I mean, that's that's obviously the sort of Marxist position. It's basically the same answer I gave before. If you are yeah. so far left that you think every you know Democrat politician in in the federal government is right wing, then I mean, it's just a matter of perspective. There's nothing. Yeah, most it, Americans it, don't agree with that. It, it is a matter of perspective, but I'd also point out that uh, even if we don't have the perspective of totally rejecting uh, capitalism, that uh, from the perspective of Canadian or British conservatives, uh, the Democratic Party is not left wing. Let, let me just say this: it's it's a very weird argument. It's a very, it's it's an unproductive argument to say let's try to redefine what the left is in America, right? It's it, you know I, I think. Um, I don't yeah, think it's, 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 it's kind of pointless. I mean, I understand this I, I, concept. I, I, of I don't think it's, 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 it's redefining, right? I mean, like we, we you know, there was just a big primary, uh, you know, for the, the second time uh, in, uh, in the last, uh, in the last, in the last four years uh, where there was a pitch conflict uh, between the left wing and centrists. I think that we know what the difference is between them. I think kind of conflated those into the same thing, I mean, okay, but, but no, but Ben Burgess, you you would acknowledge, I I imagine that the vast majority of Americans consider Joe Biden to be left wing. Would the vast majority of Americans consider Joe Biden to be left wing? I mean, the majority of Americans support lots of policies that are to the left of anything that Joe Biden is willing to say. Right, but I'm just saying that the language that we use defines Joe Biden as left wing in America, and so in order to try to say that, in fact, Joe Biden is right wing or Joe Biden is like. You know, a centrist. I would also say he's a centrist for sure. But to say he's right wing or in some way, to, you are in fact redefining what left wing means in America in the minds of most Americans. I don't think that's productive. I think we can use language that everybody understands, you know, to effectively debate these things without trying to just shift. You know, well, it's like, I, th I, th you I know. think I think most people can tell the difference between even you know without getting into communism or marxism or anything yeah, like that socialism I think, I think, versus I think, I think, mainstream I think, democrat thought i think yeah. i think most people can can see the difference between yeah. uh even, yeah which is why i'm complaining about this attempt to, to shift the language it's just silly well right we but, 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 I, but but i think that i think that calling um <laughs> corporate centrists who are opposed to reform so mild that they exist in most countries in the first world uh, left wing, I think is itself a bit of a shift in the language, right? I, I think that, I think, sure, if you want to say what we, we would consider to be right wing in America. Okay, well, we say uh, socially would, would, left or something then. Would you, yeah, I think, I think socially liberal, but I think they're we, centrists. I think that's the appropriate term. Next one. Brenton Langle strikes oh my God. again. He says, Trump is on record for trying to keep the danger of COVID from the public. His no, admin blocked issuing masks to every household. 45 is a mass murderer. <laughs> I don't know if that even deserves a response, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always these claims that, you know, Trump's lack of action. I mean, I don't, I don't believe that masks are as effective as if you are six day home uh, or wash your hands. I think those are the two things that we should have been telling people all along. We should have kept businesses open. Uh, so I don't even agree on the lockdowns that occurred or that that government guidance was good. Um, but that said, a lot of people believe in masks. They make people feel better. A lot of people, that's for sure. 
and uh, the Trump administration, Trump, Trump's, Trump's administration, Tr Trump's wrong. Trump's administration Why? has actually issued, uh, I think, 125 million masks to public schools. I mean, there has certainly been a, a massive federal attempt to try to combat this and try to, you know, masks aren't like, you know, wh why would the federal government distribute masks to every household? If, masks cost like a buck or something like that. It's like, Next it's not, it's, that's, a, that's a pointless uh, position. Sleepy so, 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 so if, if, it, if it costs a buck each, it'd be a hell of a lot cheaper than a lot of things that they've done when they, for example, how much is a box know, of masks? Sweeter? Like, bailed out uh, the cruise line, uh, cruise Five line months. industry, for example. And there are other countries like Taiwan, for example, the Ministry of Health uh, mailed a mask to every single Taiwanese citizen. And if you accept Sure. Uh, it makes it look I'm like not, they're doing something. Uh, yes, and they are doing something according to the scientific consensus that masks do, in fact, reduce the rate of infection, which, remember, according to the CDC, you said there's some WHO figure you don't remember, but according to the CDC... No, no it's not a uh, figure. 40, it's not a figure. 40% 40, 40, 40 of infections, are COVID infections, are asymptomatic. Would I, that's uh, just absolutely I mean, false. Just no, I mean, that, well, original, that is what the CDC the original, says. Maybe you know better than them, but that's what I do. The I original, definitely okay. do. The, okay, here we go. Uh, let's see. Next, this one comes in from Sleepy Dan, who says, <laughs> Democrats called Trump's early travel bans xenophobic and racist. Exactly. We could have lost so much more time or so much more to COVID without them. Gaslighting at its worst. Yeah, I understand why Trump supporters cling to this like the last little. Uh, I don't get it. He took in action. Crash, what is clinging to? In a, in a, in a crash boat. I don't understand how he's because clinging to, though. He's taking action that early. Can, that they can cling to to claim that Trump was actually on top of this when everybody knows. Certainly polls show most Americans know, common sense tells us, the facts tell us that the Trump administration responds to this has been a disaster. Now, it certainly is true that a lot of the rhetoric about China was xenophobic. It's certainly true that uh, that China in many ways- How was it saying, xenophobic? How was it xenophobic? That, Explain that, that to me. I want, that, I want to know what that uh, means. It's certainly true that uh, the, uh, that the selective a uh, focus on China was beside the point, largely as far as stopping the spread, given where most of uh, the infections were actually coming from at that point. Uh, but saying, "Oh, uh, there were you know there were Democrats who criticized him for uh, for doing this one thing." The question is, why was there? Why uh, did uh, did he drag his feet for so long? You could find yes, lots of Democrats. Who I think deserve lots of criticism for dragging their feet, not as long as he did. Uh, and why is it uh, that there was no attempt to do what we know is the only serious solution to do a serious nationwide lockdown, could have proposed legislation not to do that, absolutely would not be unconstitutional, and use that lockdown as an opportunity we, to implement the kind of test and TED trace regime. Yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. Okay, let, 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 let me read real we, quick. Just let me read. This, we, we have so many questions. I, I hate to say that we, we really probably should just okay, sorry. do one right, response let's... per question. Yeah. Uh, given that that one was for Ben, I, I think it's a good chance to move to the next one. Anthony M says, would either of you advocate for using phrenology or augury to determine voting eligibility? Isn't phrenology like the study of the human skull? Right. And <laughs> augury, I think. I don't, it, go ahead. I don't quite understand uh, the question is it a I, joke? I, I, or? I think I think he's being snotty. He's talking yeah, about, res, 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 about res, restricting that. voting to uh, more intelligent people. Uh, no, no. That, uh, so okay, I I think there's this confusion about when I say educated people should vote and not and uneducated people should not vote. Uh, that doesn't mean smart people should vote. That doesn't mean smart people should vote or stupid people shouldn't vote. I don't think there's a really good way of determining how smart somebody is or how stupid somebody is. I've met plenty of people that went to Berkeley that are complete idiots. Uh, I've met lots of uh, I've met lots of people that never went to college that are brilliant. Uh, this idea that I mean, if, if everybody's going to take an IQ test, I suppose we could determine it that way. But that's a little bit um, uh, eugenicist, I guess. No, I, I I have no interest in determining somebody's IQ or intelligence with regard to vote, uh, vo voting. Sometimes smart people make the worst decisions. Um, I'm specifically advocating people who have educated themselves on the issue. You wouldn't want um, you would not want a plastic surgeon to you know perform an appendectomy on you. 
you know, you wouldn't want the wrong, you wouldn't want an, a mechanical engineer uh, to, to come in and, and provide medical care. This might be a very smart person, but if they're not educated in the specific area in which you need them to be educated on, uh, you wouldn't want them working in that area. In the same way, is if, if there are people who know nothing about politics. You know, you got a lot of these 18 year olds that are like you know, Black Lives Matter activists. They really don't know anything about politics. You ask them about the, the issues, so they know is, nothing. This, this, this and they're going not in and all, voting. This is not at all an argument I would make. Uh, I don't believe in any of this technocratic stuff. I think that I think that most political conflicts are about different economic interests, ideology rather than level of information. But I do find it kind of funny that what Chris just said sounds to me an awful lot like an argument that we should be ruled by uh, career politicians uh, rather than uh, rather than. No, uh, Ben, real, I'm not. I'm not suggesting in any way. Guys from New York. I, what are you talking I, about? I don't understand. I'm not saying that people because, because, like because these comparisons seconds. you're making about expertise. Uh, certainly make it sound like you're saying that political decisions are best made by people with relevant expertise, uh, which would- No, presume... no, relevant knowledge, okay. relevant knowledge. Well, you don't have to have experience. You, you don't seconds, have to be- Mr. Uh, Look, Reagan, then we got to move. I, I'm, I'm talking about voters. I'm not saying that there should be laws implemented in any way whatsoever. I think that if you, okay. I think that people should be encouraged to vote and educate themselves and discourse to vote if they refuse to educate themselves. I think that that's a totally reasonable position. I don't know how anybody could disagree with that. We, I hate to do it, but we must move to the next one. We had Sunflower who said, does the left exaggerate certain things that Trump does simply as symbolic or harmful or regressive ideas, even though they're ultimately inconsequential? Yeah, I think there are cases uh, in which, um, well, some people on the left, but certainly liberals, again, because I would make that distinction, uh, have hyped up uh, relatively inconsequential uh, Trump decisions. I think that certainly happens. Uh, but I also think that the opposite happens, that there are things that Trump does uh, that are massively damaging and destruction, destructive, like the labor rulings that I started out talking about that get almost no play in the corporate media. Gotcha. Thanks so much. And stupid whore energy, as she <laughs> likes to go by, says most of Trump's My, mom, mom, you're putting you're posting <laughs> stuff on here. That's I, was that surprising. She <laughs> says most of Trump's debate claims about mail in voting was false. The dude is clearly trying to manipulate the election unethically. Say that one more time. She said, I was thinking about my mom joke and I was very proud of myself. Sorry. <laughs> she said, most of Trump's debate claims about mail in voting were false. The dude is clearly trying to manipulate the election unethically. I don't, I, I think that's a huge assumption to make, right? If you have a concern about voter fraud, um, you know, what's the evidence to suggest that that's somehow going to turn into an, a man, manipulation of the uh, election? That's, that's, you have to, a lot of people definitely think that Trump is corrupt and they hate Trump and blah, 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 blah. If you think Trump is evil, if you hate Trump, you're going to interpret everything he does in, you know, through this lens. You're just going to assume that it's all a manipulation to do something nefarious and evil. But what nefarious evil thing has he done since he's been elected? What illegal thing that he, has he done? What, what criminal, what uh, nasty political tactic? I mean, the left has taken every nasty political tactic you can imagine they impeached him for a phone call that in which he did nothing wrong I mean, there's all these nasty things the left has done trump has done nothing there was all these accusations that when trump is going to get elected he's going to declare war with north korea he's going to you know destroy all of our international relations he's improved just about every possible aspect of, of, of American standing in the world, uh, improve the economy, right? Of, of course, coronavirus crashed all that, but he'll do the same thing again when he gets elected again. I don't understand this concept of Trump's corruption when no corruption has ever been shown whatsoever. There's just this, it's bizarre. It's like people saw the assumptions that were going to occur in 2016, saw that they did not exist. Trump is in fact not corrupt, but the left in fact was. And now they're making the same claims now even though they've all, they were all disproven in 2016. It's bizarre that people think that he's so evil. Sorry. I hate to pardon. Yeah. Just uh, Soda Cabbage, don't worry, we got more for you, <laughs> says yeah. maybe Trump supporters and Mr. Reagan mirror their opinions onto Trump as, quote, what he means was, unquote. Well, possibly. That's possibly Whatever. true. I may be misinterpreting Trump, but I don't think so. Gotcha. And with that, we have – just give me a sec. I'm going to load this up. I think we had a couple of other questions come in. want to remind you, folks, both of our guests are linked in the description. So highly encourage you. You can check out all of their content at those links and want to jump into this next one. This one comes in from – Bartos Diagos, appreciate it, said, Ben, the media is fake. 
ignorance will be the USA's demise. Look, for more from the right to the left side, greets from the Netherlands. Thanks so much. Uh, True. True. I love that guy. I, okay, I'm not even sure I understood what he was saying, but uh, I didn't also didn't catch a question, so I don't know. What oh, yeah, that? yeah, that's true. It, some, a lot of times we, for Super Chats, we allow people to make a comment toward uh, the speakers that sure. they would get a chance to respond to. So you're right. This is, like, not a question. This is uh, more of a broad statement. Let's see. But yeah. one thing I didn't understand is they said, look more from the right yeah, to the I, left that, side. I didn't understand the second half, but oh, I liked like the first half. <laughs> well... <laughs> I think regard with regard to the the media and its biases, I, I said my piece, and then I didn't quite understand where it went after that. Next up, last question we have here, Brian F. Thanks for your question. Said overall, do you guys see the left or right trying to take away the freedoms from U.S. citizens, and why? Ben, uh, well, I think that uh, depending on on which freedom uh, that we're talking about, I think that some of our most important rights are rights in the workplace, uh, which is where we uh, we spend uh, half of our waking hours. Uh, and I spent a lot of my opening statement. You are so old school socialist. Through, it's going hilarious. through a litany of ways in which uh, the Trump administration uh, has undermined the rights and protections uh, of uh, of working people. Give me I an example. That, uh, really? Okay. I, I, okay. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we can look at, uh, for example, the uh, the COVID era, sorry, uh, NLRB rulings, uh, where um, where it's uh, Trump's NLRB has ruled that employers uh, are not obligated to bargain over paid sick leave and hazard pay. Uh, this is in places that are already union shops. Uh, employers are also uh, free from having to bargain uh, over a. Um, over a uh, uh, temporary closure, and most disturbingly, uh, the Trump-appointed board uh, has uh, declared that speaking out against your company's COVID safety procedures is not protected speech. In other words, you can be fired for raising concerns during a deadly pandemic. This is in addition to what I mentioned earlier about using COVID as a pretext uh, to stop uh, elections to certify uh, to certify new unions. This is in addition to rulings from Trump's NLRB that, for example, uh, when you have public spaces uh, that are still part of an employer's property, like the area outside of a grocery store where you might see the Salvation Army, uh, in the past, uh, unions had to be allowed to use those public areas that were open to other groups in order to give workers information about, for example, a union they're trying to organize. Uh, that's no longer the case. Another example would be a Trump executive order about uh, about federal employees, uh, you, know, probably, you know, making it harder uh, for shop stewards to file grievances. So yeah, there's a long list of these things. Also, if we're not, if we're going to look outside of the workplace, already mentioned Julian Assange, where I was very happy that, you know, that Chris agreed that that is indeed uh, very bad, uh, what's, uh, what's happened there. Uh, the I'm Obama not sure Trump is actually, uh, you know, aggressively well, the, aggressively pursuing that that was an obama situation well the obama administration actually made the decision not i mean they did tons of things in this area that i strongly disagree with no question about that i think i think in a lot of ways it was very very bad on the national security civil liberty stuff but they did make the decision not to seek uh extradition uh of assange uh on these on these charges which doing so dramatically undermines uh, freedom uh, freedom of the press. If you can if you can go after uh, a foreign journalist uh, for encouraging uh, the uh, the leaking of information that's classified within the United States, that really really undermines our ability as Americans to find out bad stuff that our government is doing uh, that we might uh, that we uh, that we might want to look at. So I think that those are both areas uh, in which uh, in which the uh, the Trump administration uh, has uh, has really uh, undermined uh, our freedoms. I also think that the uh, that the encouragement of really heavy-handed uh, responses. I'm not talking about riots and looting here, uh, but to, in the overwhelming majority of cases, peaceful protests, which has included lots of attacks on journalists uh, by, uh, you know, by riot cops and the way the Trump administration- By rioters, uh, I think you mean. By riot cops. By uh, rioters. They, you know, uh, that is not at all what I mean, Chris. They have a- no, I uh, have friends that are in there getting physically attacked by rioters. Okay. 
So both things can be true that there are that there are in fact cases uh, where you know where I don't think that was intentional have, have attacked have attacked journalists. There are tons of cases. I don't where think that's completely Trump's irrelevant. Anyway. Trump isn't going attacked, out physically attacking the media. Well, for, no, for he's covering the national the guard to do that. But in no. any case. Uh, yeah, I think that the I think that uh, as in many areas, I think when it comes to national security and civil liberty stuff, I think Biden has nothing to write home about. I think Trump is a disaster. Okay, let me answer this in one minute. You took I think sixteen hours to answer that question. I will oh, I will just really quickly. Uh, okay, that was very convoluted. Oh and shit! I got another sixteen hours in me. All right. All right. <laughs> I don't think that was particularly convincing. I think that okay. nobody really thinks that Trump is trying to dismantle any you know, fundamental American rights, but the left definitely is. They're going after your freedom of speech, right? We know that we're censored on every kind of social media. The left doesn't care about that. Uh, they're going after our gun rights. Everybody knows that. They want to uh, undercut the Second <laughs> Amendment completely. They under want to undercut the Second Amendment completely. They're going no after our religious, they're going about, after our religious okay. liberties. They're going after our religious liberties, but only for Christians, only for Christians. Nobody's going in, after in, Christians' religious false, liberties. False, false. Uh, in California, in, world can false. I finish? Can I finish? Uh, I'm speaking. I am speaking. Okay, so, <laughs> so that sorry, was my so, best so, Kamala Harris so that was my sorry. best Kamala uh, Harris uh, impression. You're, you're right. I'm, I'm being. Trumped. I can't believe a white man is is trying to mansplain to me. This is ridiculous. Um, no, in California, they're actually trying to dismantle our civil rights protections, so that, specifically so that they can uh, 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 bring back you know affirmative action laws, so that they can um, aggressively try to uh, oppress white and Asian people in terms of like going to schools and things like this. Bring back things like quotas. It's bizarre what they're trying to do. They're trying to end civil liberties on the left. It's there's, there's the, the number the number of rights that they're trying to take away from us from the left is absurd. There's paranoid hysteria. There's really no. bad paranoid hysteria. There's this is real that stuff, white man. people are somehow oppressed in the United States. Uh, I mean, systemically, I, systemically. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's fascinating. Go, <laughs> we had one last one come in. Blue Heron, thanks for your question. Said. N16, Trump claimed millions of people voted illegally. Uh, I think they meant like in 2016. And then he yeah, said, do yeah. you believe him? Is that the kind of evidence you need before supporting Trump staying in power? I think that was hyperbole. Gotcha. I think he thought a lot of people voted illegally. I don't think he knew what the number was. I think that was just sort of a hyperbolic expression. Yeah, that's the kind of thing where, where people, you know, when Trump was running, this was before he won, uh, and there was this big movement toward Trump, a, a brilliant reporter, I forget what their name was, but they, they made the observation that Trump supporters take Trump seriously, but they don't take him literally. And the left take Trump's, takes everything Trump says literally, but they don't take him seriously, right? There's a lot of misinterpretation of what Trump says, because Trump doesn't speak like, you know, especially clearly all the time. And I accept that that is a that is a problem with Donald Trump, but it's not, I think that is absolutely critical that reporters and the press try to find what the actual, you know, the, the most appropriate interpretation of what Trump's saying is instead of the least charitable interpretation of what Trump's saying is, because that's what they do every single time. And it creates um, an, an incomplete and inaccurate picture of what Trump is about and what he's saying. And I actually think Ben Burgess, I think you would actually agree with that to some degree. Uh, do I think that uh, that Trump is that a, the left that the left wing often, media often, or that the media speaks in a barely coherent stream? No, of that's not what it's my question hard, is. I'm talking specifically about how the media interpret interprets interprets, well, let's give interprets let's give uncharitably what Trump says in every instance they possibly can. I, I think, think you there, agree that's true. I think that there are cases in which uh, in which there are there are statements that you know that have uh, have been overblown. I think that that's happened. Misrepresented. I, I think, think that I think that it's also happened that there are many 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 times uh, that he'll say crazy things and Republicans will scramble to try to find some oh, what he really meant is, and oftentimes there's a little whiff of Mod and Bailey, which is where you. Uh, you know, where you say something to try to be provocative. Uh, and if you're challenged too much on it, you can retreat to, oh, what I actually meant was, and that if you're actually that bad at communicating that this is something that comes up constantly, then perhaps president isn't the ideal job for you. I, I do think it comes up occasionally, but I don't know if that is a defining characteristic of Trump. 
I think more often he's misinterpreted than he employs Martin Bailey, which I do agree that he does do. He will say something that's uh, explosive, provocative, you know, meant to get some attention in the media. But I do think more often the media just intentionally misrepresents what he's saying. We should probably, if it's a, a decent time to wrap it up. I know that, Ben, is Michigan, you're in lower Michigan. Are you guys in Eastern time or Central? Oh, we're in Eastern time. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, getting pretty late. And then, Mr. Reagan. I'm I good. Should... I don't know what your guys' problem is. <laughs> Sir, are you in California? Is that it? I am. Yeah, I'm in California. Good for you. Well, <laughs> so what you. we'll do is I uh, want to say I enjoy these guys so much, folks. So I encourage you to check out their links below. They are just – this has been so much fun. And so want to let you know, reminder, folks, you are welcome here. No matter what walk of life you come from, we, we really do appreciate you hanging out with us. And so, again, want to say a huge thanks to our guests, though. Thanks so much, Ben and Mr. Reagan, for being here with us. All right. Thanks, James. Thank you, guys. My pleasure. With that, folks, keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Take care and have a great weekend. And we'll be back tomorrow night.